Four years ago today, January 15th, there was a massacre at a luxury hotel in the capital of Kenya, in Nairobi. Al-Shabaab took responsibility for the attack later on, killed 19 innocent civilians. The fight went on for 19 hours into the 16th of January. There was a rogue SAS operator who went in to save countless civilians, and he is on the podcast today. This is one that has been a long time coming, and he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you get anything out of these shows, please head over to Apple and Spotify. Leave us a review, like, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching over there. And don't forget, there are tons, literally hundreds and hundreds of reels that you can download for free. Make them into what you want. Put them all over your social media. Make money. Monetize it. We don't care. All we ask is that you tag the Sean Ryan Show so everybody knows where it came from. And in the meantime, please welcome, some call this man Obi-Wan Nairobi. I call him Christian Craighead. Please welcome him to the Sean Ryan Show. God bless. Love you all. See you soon. Christian Craighead, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. It's good to uh, good to finally be here. It's good for you to finally be here. I've been waiting for this for phew, years. Yeah. Years. Then you came to Nashville. We hung out a little bit, yeah. set a date. That got canceled. You're finally in house, and I am yeah. stoked for this interview, man. So thank you for coming. I think it's just, it, it, we'll just put this in now. Uh, the the funny story is when we we came to or I came to Nashville for the SCI, met up with you for coffee, and then. Sean Ryan and Chris Craighead were just two dudes walking around the streets for about two hours just chatting. <laughs> and, and, and some of my friends was like, that's like a really odd thought. And I, I never thought much about it at the time, but it, it kind of, so that, that happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think we got, uh, I think we got made a couple of times out there. Well, you did. I didn't. Well. I took the photographs though. That was a good thing, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Well, hey, let me give you a quick introduction here. So... <laughs> Christian Craighead, UK Army Special Forces, 28-year military career, most of which, correct me if I'm wrong, is in the British SAS, retired warrant officer, second class, special air service, parachute reg regiment in the British Army, eventually SAS, awarded conspicuous gallantry cross for actions in Nairobi, Kenya. You're a member of the Order of the British Empire, the MBE. You're the author of The Wrong Wolf, the author of, what's the book that's in? One Man In. One Man In, which is tied up in court right now. Known as Obi-Wan Nairobi, and you are a Armani jeans model. <laughs> so, which we'll get into later. You were wearing Armani jeans that day and, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff that got real popular after that incident. But, um, you know, we got a lot of stuff to cover, Christian. I want to cover your childhood, we'll get into a little bit of the incident, you know, what happened that day, if we can. And then um, we got a whole slew of stuff after that incident, what you're doing today. But um, everybody starts out with a gift on the show. Any guesses? Maybe gummy bears? It's definitely a possibility. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah, the, the famous gummy bears. I mean. Famous gummy I mean, bears. Those are legal. So yeah. Even in the UK. <laughs> well, I, as you say, everyone starts off with a with a gift, and I've got one for you. Oh man. So, um, um, like, I know we're, we're going to get onto the the subject of faith later on, but um, you know, God forbid that you ever have to put your body armor on again to uh, defend yourself and your family or, or 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 your ideals. But if should you ever do that, I'd like to give you this armor upgrade. Oh man. Thank you. Thank you. It's a Bible. So, Thank that, you, man. That's um that's a, a Bible with um the I design designed the image on the front, which is You designed this? Well I had the idea and, and then a uh, uh, someone else actually put it together. A good friend of mine, Carl, and um, it's the send me in the in the in the 
Thank you, man. That is awesome. I love this. I'll probably frame it and put it in the studio. Okay. But um, and then it could be like break, break glass in case, in case of Exactly. Emergency. Break glass in case of war. Well, since we're on the faith subject, I actually got you a little something too. So <clears throat> here you go. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So do you know who Dom Razo is? Uh, yeah. So that, we had spoken about the Jim Caviezel episode last night, mm -hmm. which is no more, but I gave Jim the exact same rosary. And we had a lot of conversations before the interview, and I just had a feeling that man was going to need a lot of protection. And so Dom, Dom's a former mm -hmm. SEAL Team 6 guy, um, gave me that rosary. I gave it to Jim Caviezel. Then he sent me another one, and I, I carry that everywhere to protect myself. And uh, I know we're going to get into some fascinating stories about some encounters that you've had, especially before some very important missions. And uh, I just wanted to give that to you. Thank you, know, you so it much. It means a lot to me. And uh, Dom is a is just a he's just an awesome human being. And and uh, I thought you should have it because you're coming out and you have a lot of cards stacked against you back in the UK right now. And maybe that'll give you some protection. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. But um, and thank you for this. God bless, brother. <clears throat> but childhood. You ready to dig in? Yeah. Let's are you go. nervous? Um, a, l a little bit, but. We'll see. What are you nervous about? Um, like not being, not being exciting enough. Not being it's a, and and you know I'm I'm trying to. Uh, I'll tell my story, and uh, and I think, I think just to start with, it's is it interesting? Maybe is it cliched sometimes, but you could call childhood, and this is applicable for everyone. Is this is when your training starts? Mm -hmm. Because whatever you do whether it be an international event, whether it be you're a sportsman, a soldier, a manager, or you, you're you in training the, the moment you are born. That's when your training starts and you're being prepared for something. Mm -hmm. And some some things are bigger than others, Yeah. but you're always in training. So you could start, you could say it's my childhood. It's one way of framing it. The other way of saying it is it's the start of my training. I will say this. When it comes to the nervousness, everybody that comes here is nervous. Everybody thinks, oh, it's not going to be exciting. Don't worry about that, Ben. It's, <laughs> it's going to be gold, I promise. And, um, and uh, I know you're kind of hanged up or tied up with some of, the, with some of your career. And uh, I would like to offer you, when you're not tied up anymore, uh, a slot here to to give a full scope and depth on everything. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, I, and I think a lot, um, some people may be aware of this, I don't really talk about my career in the um, Special Air Service. And um, and that's just my policy right right now. There's mm -hmm. some things I could talk about, but I just choose not to. Uh, and like, like other things, p policies change, people change. Yeah. And viewpoints change. So in the future, I'm, I'm I may talk about some stuff good. that I don't talk about right now. But. It's all good, all in due time, and there's plenty other to talk about. So let's start with childhood. Mm -hmm. Where'd you grow up? So I uh, grew up in northeast England, so um, about five hours drive north of London. And uh, it was, yeah, I didn't really like my childhood. Why not? Um, the I was the, the town where I grew up is a beautiful town. I grew up in a in a council a council house and council house is like state owned property, so it's like a poorer area of town. Um, and I grew up to I had a single single mother. I never met my father uh, until later on in life. Um, um, so I grew up with uh, for the first seven years uh, my mother, my aunt, and my grandma. My grandmother is the the person I am today. She, she takes full responsibility of of the man I became. It's all because of her. Wow! And she and she uh, she 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 raised me. And I didn't. And I had. 
it's strange when I was talking to someone else about childhood, what you think is normal isn't sometimes a lot of the time isn't normal mm -hmm. what, what people there's probably a lot of people out there who maybe get abused and don't really know they're getting abused there's so it's it's only maybe when you wake you may wake up to it later on in life um and and then you see and you think yeah that wasn't cool but, but. did you have any brothers and sisters no I, I i so i grew up as an only child um but my natural father is probably one of the most fertile men of the 1970s. So if you're from Northeast England and you don't know who your dad is, we're probably related. But, wow. um, but um, I've got lots of like half brothers and sisters. What is it about your childhood that you didn't like? It, I think it was... You brought up abuse. Um, yeah, I think it, it was this, and it wasn't, there was, what I say is plenty of love in my life. It, it was, it was, it wasn't abuse from family or anything like that. But it was just um, being exposed to violence at a really young age, and and that set a sort of values in me. Which what some kind people, of violence? So there's some things I don't want to share in the light of day, and so the uh, I think that the the worst one. The worst experience I had was when I was eight years old, and I just started at a new school. And there was it's about a mile and a half walk back near Woodland, and we'll talk about the Woodland later, which is on a more happier note. And I was walking home, and um, a nice warm September day, and um, eight years old, and I was walking, and these two guys were there, two two older boys who had just been released from young offenders from juvie, and um, the 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 one was if it, off the roughly about six years older than me, and then the other one was about the same age as him. So they would have been um, like 15, 14, 15 years old, and I, I'm I was always quite small and thin. And they were like, "Hey, what are you doing?" And I'm like, "Nothing." And then one of them just hit me around the head with a with a branch, hit me to the ground, and then they went on to sort of torture me for about two hours. Torture, yeah. What so kind they were of just torture? like just beating me up, like like one of them would be sitting on my chest, and like one of them like took some dog shit and smeared it on my face, and like like lit like cigarettes on me and stuff, and damn, and give me a, a kicking, and then and then I think the worst thing what what the um did is like I had a packed lunchbox and I didn't seem to do, but they filled, put loads of dog shit inside my packed lunchbox and then sealed it back up, so I didn't see that till later on when I was at home, and that was a thing that was I thought was quite that got to me. Um, and then, uh, and I, and I ran home eventually and my stepdad at the time went out and sort of had a talk and look for them. And my mother did as well. And I was obviously distressed and they were distressed. And, and, and I think that was my first, even though I'd been, um, beat up and set on fire and stuff like that before. Hold on, set on fire? Well, not set on fire. So. Is that <laughs> so, a figure of speech? No, I, not literally set on fire, but it's okay. how I escaped. Um, is um, I'll talk about that bit in, in a in a in a moment, but that to me was like pure evil that I witnessed. Mm -hmm. I thought, and then, but here's the interesting thing: even at a young age, I was thankful. You know what I was thankful for? I was Lord. thankful if that was me, because I can I can take that. That was me, and I and I'm certain, and I'm that's one of the biggest reasons I'm glad for. If it wasn't if it wasn't me that day. They had they had the taste of blood in their mouth. It would have been someone else, and if I'd been an eight year old girl, they would have they would have raped me. I know that I could see that, and uh, so that was the part for me was like I'm glad it was me because yeah. I can I can I can deal with that, and um, um, yeah. Where <laughs> did you know these guys? I knew of one of them, and then I I actually met one of them later on in life, and I turned the tables a little bit. And some people say it's not good what I did, but I give him a, a, a kick in and he begged for his life. He didn't know who I was. How 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 long ago? Or what, what oh, what's the time frame here? That would have been probably about 13, 14 years later. No shit. And I I, bring, I recognize that. Pure so scumbag like riding a BMX with tracksuit, 21 years old. Tracksuit bottoms tucked into his into his uh, socks. 
like at night, walk running, and my eyes just straight away locked on like a missile lock. I know who that is. First time I've seen him since. I know who that is. And uh, yeah, and I, as he drove past, as he rolled past, I grabbed him by the neck, and then and then um, <clears throat> issued out some tough justice. So good for you. And then, uh, how did that feel? Did you feel good afterwards, or did you regret it? Oh, I didn't regret it. No, no. I mean, it's maybe not a good message to put out to people. But uh, sometimes you gotta, sometimes you gotta do it. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta put on that armor. And, and did they know who it. you were? No. Did you let them know who you were? No. What did you say? Nothing. Nothing. No. What did they say? Like the normal stuff. What someone's begging for their life says. So. What is the normal stuff? Please stop whatever I've done. Stop and and just so everyone's all there was no mistaken identity. It was him. Um. But. Right on. Let's move on. Yeah. Uh, but the fire thing, a few years before that, when I was about four or five, um, I used to try and hang around with the older kids in the in my estate. And sometimes I'd be like a, a pain in the pain in the neck to them. So they again it, I, I don't think it's evil. It's just, you know, sometimes sometimes kids can be brutal. Mm -hmm. So these were much older than me. They had like good these were being teenagers as well when I was about four or five years old. And there's two incidents. Um, uh, one was when I was I walked into the woods, and the woods was I lived next to a set of woods, and it was just a small like a small burn, but it was known as my woods because I knew it from an early age. I used to go there by myself, and up until just before the army, I'd know it like the back of my hands, and 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 uh, and yeah, I loved it. I still walk through it now when I go to my hometown, and you know, think of these things, and and and, and the guys were playing with an air rifle. And I said, oh, what are you doing? And one of them turned and with a big smirk just shot me in the leg with the, and I was about four years old, in the, th in the thigh. And I was screaming, howling, thinking, why did you do that? The other one who seemed, always seemed to be nicer than the others took the, took the air rifle off me. And I thought, oh, good, he's going to step in. And then he shot me and he took it and then laughed and shot me in the other leg. I think then they realized what they'd done. And then they tried to smooth it over and and I've still got two scars on my leg. When I get a sun, when my legs get suntanned, which isn't often, you can see the two white marks here and here. Oh, good on my on my on my legs. So there's things like that. Um, but then the um, <laughs> so another story in this came out when I was in uh, on operations. A, a whole load of the guys were talking about things that make them scared, and they said I'd hate to be put in a in like a bag. And I said oh, I've been tied in a bag before, and they went what? And I said, yeah, when I was younger, they, they were playing Batman and Robin. I turned up and said, what are they doing? They're playing Batman and Robin, and you're going to be one of the bad guys. So they had a potato sack, and they stuffed me in this potato sack and tied a knot in the top. And then they started kicking the potato sack around and beating me. And um, and the guys are looking at me going, what? And, and they went, well, how did you get out? I said, oh, when they set it on fire, I managed to escape. So that was my fire story. Holy shit. Um, so... You were bullied quite a bit as a kid. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, that, and this is the thing, isn't like honestly. I was just about to say there was I bullied because in my in like do you know when you normalize chaos, you normalize violence, and um, so that's they're, they're they're the most they're not the most graphic things that ever happened to me, but but as I've said to someone very close to me, I said that's that's those the other things that are the worst they stay in here. And don't I don't think they deserve to see the light of day. But um, um, why are you? You're pretty closed up. You keep a lot of stuff internalized. It sounds like. What? Why do you do that? I think it's because I've been betrayed all my life. And and who it, is the most important person that's betrayed you? Oh. Uh, I mean, we know your government. Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, that was the, that was the answer I was going to say, but um, I think it's just people. If your parents, <laughs> women, yeah, wives. I mean, a bit of bit of women, parents. It's I mean, it's all the it's. I mean, everyone's got their own heartache, if you like. And then sometimes well, one I, of the things about the show, Christian, is sharing experiences because people learn from that. Yeah, and and and. And it helps them get through the trauma. And so for somebody like you to be sitting here who's experienced that kind of stuff and overcome it, 
when you share those experiences, that sends a wave into the world. Mm -hmm. And people learn from men like you who've overcome that because they yeah. look up to you. You know, and so when you share that and you talk about how you overcame it, you know, it it it's it's like a wave of good that gets tossed into the world and people ride that. And, and I think so from from a portrayal point of view, I mean every, everyone's no one's totally innocent. Like I can say like oh a girl may have dumped me or broke my heart, but you know, I probably had some something to do with it. Mm -hmm. And like I'm not perfect. And then um but it's that's the thing is is being alone. It's that feeling of alone. So like when you're just um an only child, but then there's that thing when you find yourself on your own, it's it, it you I think from an early age it was a defense mechanism me mechanism for me to then go, okay, I can do this. I'm strong. I, I and then I'll move on and do things. And then every now and again I sometimes let someone in. And then when I let them in, sometimes they might not see what they like. Or I might show them too much. And it's this thing about being Christian Craighead versus my real self. And um and 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 then and then they might not like what they see and then move on and then I think I should never I should never I should have just lived a, like a lie. I should have pretended to be someone who I'm not. And that way everyone's happy. And every now and again, if you show them the real me, they might go, Yeah, I didn't like that. I liked I like the normal person because like in 2019 when I launched a one man hostage rescue mission if you like mm -hmm. um, again I, I don't want to go I'm not going to go into the details of the of the thing life had prepared me for that moment mm -hmm. and it and it's a thought I have and it's sometimes eat, uh, eating me up a lot is for life to prepare me for that one for that day, I had to be different. It, and merely, um, uh, merely who was in merely Chapin, the author of *Terrorist Attack Girl*, who was in in the Deuce at D two hotel. So her husband said to him, and said to her, "Sorry, um, like Chris wasn't the right man at the right place that day. He was the man who had to be there that day." Because everything in life had prepared me for that moment. Mm -hmm. The mindset, the skill set, everything was, it was odd. Everything lined up for that. But then this, the thought of, in order to be that p person for that day, maybe I'm like a tool, like a specialist tool, that it's really good for this job, and you might use it once, and then after that, it's useless. So I have, and 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 the, I have. Sometimes I think, can I fit in with normal society? And I'm not a, a crackpot, as you know. You met me personally, and I've met your family, and it's. But I just think, am I, am I suitable for normal life? Do you? It sounds like you put a lot of maybe validity. I don't know if that's the correct word, but you. You really put you you put a lot of importance on what other people think. Um, sometimes, yeah. I mean, why yeah. do you do that? I don't know. It's you. It's a yeah. It's you. Maybe. Who gives a shit if they don't like you? Yeah, honestly. But it's this thing of trying to it's trying trying to live my life and fit in, and then sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah. Who do I'm, you want to fit in with? Well, I don't know. I just like get on in life, and it's like what I'm chasing. It, it's this thing like everything costs something, and I didn't wake up and become. And became Chris Craighead. I w it was a long, hard slog to January two thousand nineteen, mm -hmm. and it cost me everything. It cost me family. It cost me relationships. It cost me my soul in some cases. And um, so it's just it's coming to it's coming, and, and that's one of the things of maybe getting ahead of ourselves. But um, about you know trying to find purpose in life, and and right now I've got some things coming in. But I still, in my mind, think I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So part of me sometimes think, "Am I rounds complete? Have I have I done what I'm supposed to be put on this earth for? And now I'm just waiting to die." Would you mind um, if I make a suggestion? No. Do you think you're going to find what your purpose is by trying to cater to the crowd and fit yeah. in? 
I mean, yeah, that, and that's what I realised is that's what I'm, I was getting at is sometimes I'll open it and do it and then go, no, what am I doing? And then withdraw back in, withdrawing. And then so it's it's just trying to feel like we do, trying to work, see what works, what doesn't work. But think, then, but going back to childhood, um, yeah, and but so they set the sack on fire and I escaped. One of the a good friend of mine said, "That's why Chris is how he is." So how am I? Well, those people might be horrified, or people might say, "Yeah, no big deal. What happened there as a kid?" But that did something to me. Those those types of incidents did something to me, and. What they did was, from a very early age of about, well, starting from about four years old and chipping away all the way up until teenager, is they made me not tolerate bullies, to stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves and do the right thing when you can. And that's why I think it's part of the training. Although it's horrific, and I'd hate to happen it to, if I... If, that happened to someone I love, and I'd, I'd go and hunt them people down. But it, but it, but it was required, I think. And then, and that put me into this childhood flex of like acting. Like for me, I was quite thin, small. So if I saw anyone as a threat, or if I saw, I'd, I'd resort to violence straight away. I'd be like, yeah, someone like. Did something I knew I knew it was potential because I was small that they'd, so I'd just punch, punch him in the face. Was it their temper or was it calculated? It was um, combination. I think more calculated than it was temper. And um, and this is the thing because I know that if I if bullies will be bullies. So if some I, I would read the room and if I knew that I knew that they'd like look at me he's the smallest I'm going to do something to him. So I just be like yeah no you're not. And it and and I and and and, and obviously life in the 1980s was different. People had fist fights at school all the time. Mm -hmm. They were kind of, it's not like, a, it's, now would be a huge thing. I'm not condoning it uh, now. I'm not saying to you, any young people watching this, go out and fight violence with violence because it's a different, it's, it's a different time now. The underlying message that you're sending is, is timeless. It's don't get pushed around. Yeah. Stand up for yourself stand up for others yeah and and that's what those, those acts of violence and abuse through my throughout my life and there's there's lots um that's what they these ended up setting me in and luckily um i didn't fall into the wrongs on the wrong side of the law with that violence and things calmed i started calming down and one of the things i always say saved my life if you like was the army cadets so the army cadets in uk is like a youth organization where at the age of 13 you join and you get issued a uniform and you do two parade nights a week and you do get inspected and you do lessons on field craft, marksmanship, that kind of thing. So youth organization. And uh, and I all I wanted to do was join the army or be a, be a warrior from, from as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a, a soldier. And so I, I joined, I lied about my age and joined when I was 12 and then, um, and then just started doing that and, and and that saved my life because at the same time, and I think there's it's hard to disagree with this, 12, 13 years, 13 years old is a time when you are at a junction in your life. Like you see when a lot of people go, you know, good kids fall prey to crime and drugs and things like that. It's usually around about the, tw the, the start point is usually about 13 years old. That's the time when you, there might be, missing classes at school and going around the smoking at the back of the school and doing whatever they whatever happens now it's usually about that age when you start falling off falling off falling going off off the on the wrong track and and that certainly happened in my set of friends then i was the only one who joined the army cadets and those friends people who I was friends was i believe all of them have been inside prison now some of them may have died of overdoses. I'm sure two of them have died of overdoses since then. And because it's, again, it's going to sound like a, a grown up, but just the act of smoking a cigarette can lead to heroin addiction. It's the mm -hmm. it's the gateway into this bad thing. I'm, I'm not saying everyone did it, but I, I, as everyone fell completely off the tracks, but that's at that point. So it's a bit of waffle there to say that at 13 years old, I joined the 
Army Cadets, and that saved my life, gave me purpose, two nights of the week, there doing the lessons, and every now and again you go away for a weekend, and in the summer you do like an annual camp of two weeks away. And uh, that really set me up for, uh, it set me up for joining the Army, but also but I was going to join the Army anyway. But it was mm-hmm. just, like I said, I think it saved my life, gave me purpose, and uh, and and especially at, um, at at 13 years old, my grandmother, uh, my grandma, she died, and that's when I felt truly alone. So yes, my mother may say she loved me, ex stepdad and other people, but I was really it was only my grandmother who really knew me, who was really who who really believed in me, and really saw me who, who, who for who I was. She knew I wasn't got. She knew I was different, and she and she, like without my grandmother, I don't know what would happen to me. But she she put in these core values and so a combination of obviously the bad stuff, but she she made me respectful to people. To like at school at school, it might be like again people might say, well, he's a bit of a thug. He's like beating people up or whatever. Like I say, it's a different time. But I was always super super respectful to school teachers. It was always really polite to the school teachers and things like that. And and that was just because my grandma, my grandma would say, like there'd be a woman walking down the street, like an older woman, and she'd go, go across and help help her with the bags. Give your seat up to people on the on the on the bus or when we're traveling. Give your seat up to that lady. Okay. And Why so, do you think your grandma was able to see that you're different? I, I don't know. I think it was just that connection. That you were closer to her than your mother? Oh yeah, I was closer to her than to, than to anyone. Why is that? What did your mother do for a living? She worked a night shift and um, different, like, in the care industry. But uh, yeah, stepdad, factory worker, factory worker. Do you I, think maybe they were just busy with their occupations? No, they're just. Again, I don't want to throw dirt around too much mm-hmm. um, because people would be going, "Oh, I wasn't that bad, or was, and whatever." The bottom line is, it doesn't I'm, matter what people think. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for those two people, especially. Not because of, because what they did was it's the, it's like the saying there is no enemies or friends, just teachers. And they, when I was looking, even from as young as eight, nine years old, I was looking at those two and say, I'm never going to be like used to. So, was your grandma always around? Did you live with her? Um, so because my mother worked night shift three nights a week, so every three nights of the week, um, with my grandma. But every single day, I went round to her house. And so every single day, with the exception of one day. So in, in 1989, I went away on like a, with the school had like a, a weekend away, um, or so it was a week away, and um, like doing climbing and outdoor outdoor activities and things. And um, I had a camouflage jacket that, and had and my grandmother's doing the, she sewed the, I cut the tops off two pairs of socks and, and then my grandma sewed them onto the cuffs, so it looked like, I mean, it's a thing that people used to do. But I lost my temper when she was doing that the night on the Sunday night, and then was screaming and showering, and she was screaming and showering at me. But we, it all, it all, it all came back together at the end, and I said sorry, and and uh, and she'd always say, "Oh, you test the patience of a nun." And um, and then uh, that, and then the next day I went, and I went away that week, and and usually I came back, I got back on the. Um, it was the I think it was the the Sunday or was the Sunday, and for the first time ever, I didn't go to her house on the way home from school because um, it's kind of on the way, and I just because I was I think it was because I was carrying gear and stuff, so I went straight home. But as soon as I got home, I I uh, picked up the telephone on the wo- and give her a call and said, "Hey, Grandma, yeah, it was a good week, and she, we're talking." And um, and I said, oh, "I'm not coming around tonight," and then she was going to go babysit for my. Um, other some other members of family. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. And she goes, Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. And she goes, I love you, I love you too. Like I did every day, always always called her. Remember, this is before mobile phones. And then um and then she went to um my auntie's house and then then I, then my dad got a, my stepdad got a call. He looked and didn't say anything. And then he said, Look, you know, your grandma's had a heart attack. So she's in hospital. So um yeah, so I just ran out the door. And um, ran to, into my hometown. Don't know what I was doing. I don't know where I was running. I was just running. It was like a, you know, like a irrational mm-hmm. th- 
thing that you do is go out running. Like I just ran and it was like dark. It was February evening, and uh, she's and obviously now he I can't he can't do anything. He can't find me, so I'm just there and I and then I go to where uh, there's a church in town. And I didn't go to the church, but it's very old. Um, and there's like a a gateway sort of thing into the church, and it's got a cross on the top. And I just look. I was just sat on the on the bench opposite it, and I was looking at the cross, and I was just like pleading with God, please don't take her away from me. And I was like, <sighs> like, because I can't. This is not supposed to happen. She's my only supporter. She's my she's my link, and um, <clears throat> and more importantly, she's the only person who believes in me. And uh, so I'm looking, pleading with God, and then uh, so then I, I run home. Then, like, something makes me run home, and he goes, right, we're getting in a tack cab, and we're going to the hospital, which is about um, eight miles away. So we're going home, and uh, get to the hospital, and then uh, I never saw her again, because as I walked in, she died. So the the takeaway point from that is, I mean, it's it's always um, sod's law, you know, the one time I didn't go to see her. Is it? And, and I always say, I've said it to so many people all the way through my life is, if you love someone or care for someone dearly, if you have an argument, whether it be your mother, your brother, wife, girlfriend, friend, if you ever have an argument, don't leave on bad terms. Always resolve it because you never want, because it's always a possibility that's the last time you'll ever see them. That's a great point. You know, me and my wife have a rule. We never go to bed angry. Yeah. We always work it out before we go to bed for that reason. Yeah, so she, yeah, my grandma, she, um, like, she made me the man I am, and then, uh, and I still think about her every day. That's amazing. I'm sorry to hear that um, she's not with us anymore. Christian, I want to dive into your purpose. So, we keep, we keep, forgive me, but I'm going to put you on the spot. We keep going back to what p other people are going to think, and so my question for you is: Do you think you're going to find your purpose? by catering to what you think people that you don't even know want from you. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the trap I'm falling into, so I'm, I don't. But it's... I mean, to... to, to and, and this to is be, probably... You're a man with a... I mean, the amount of courage that you can muster up in situations is like nothing people have ever seen. I mean, you entered a hotel where people were being slaughtered by Al-Shabaab against your country's orders. You did that. Nobody does that. And now let's fast forward. That happened in 2019. Let's fast forward to four years. We're worried about what other people think. Does that add up to you? It's, it's probably what, what I think it is doing a self-diagnosis is it's a side effect of being alone, of like... The, like is it called abandonment syndrome you know my you know my, my you know my grandma died but she in essence she left me and um so it's it's a, it's like this thing about i don't want to be alone like I, i'm trying to but like i say it's testing and adjusting no it's not gonna it's not gonna give me my purpose but i kind of some and sometimes i don't want to be alone and then i realize i am alone and we're all alone but that that's the problem it's part adjustment of coming out of the military after 28 years so, and part of this, like, just trying to, trying to work it out. I mean, that's part of being alone, though. I mm. mean, that's part of, I mean, you're a leader. You're a leader of men. And leaders are lonely. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. They are. But, uh, because yeah. Because you have to make the tough calls. Mm. You have to lead. So... Yeah, and so it's all just been about like finding my feet, really, you know, and and I'm still looking. I'm still looking to try and find this purpose and and see see what it is. What you know, there's things I want to do and there's things I'm doing, but there's still nothing that is like filling my soul. Like as a young person, I wanted to be a soldier, and then when I was in the army, I wanted to get into the unit, and when I was in the unit, I wanted to do X, Y, and Z. And then there's this big void now of like, well, what do I want to do? And I'm still, and and, I'm, and again, it's not a negative. It's it's like a, I'm sure it's going to come to me. And I think it's it, going to it's, come it's to you. It's probably come to me when I'm not even looking for it. That's how it always works. Well, I think it's going to come from the heart, and the, mm -hmm. and 
when you push everybody else's opinions and all their all their bullshit that they think that you should be doing to the side, I think that's that's the opportunity where it's going to come to you. Hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a thing. But... What's the argument? Well, yeah. Let's. What is it? What's the argument? Again, I'm just trying to do what what the right thing is, but, um, and then see what the rather than based on the opinion of me. Again, it's trying to. I'm not trying to cater to everyone. It's, I mean, maybe I'm. That's a bit out of context, like being taken out of context a bit. But I'm not. But I'm just trying to find find my way. But the the problem is, is I'm not. There is, there is no. It's just the fact I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not, I'm, I I don't I don't know what I I don't know what my purpose is yet. I'm still trying to pin it down. And I'm, yeah. I think you know your purpose. You've got great messaging. I mean, last night at dinner with me and my wife, you you rattled off a few purposes. I mean, one of them is that book right there. Yeah. You know, the 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 wrong wolf, standing up for what you believe in, standing up for people that can't stand up for themselves. I mean, that's. It seems to be the lifelong. It, it's following you, hmm. everywhere you go. Oh, we'll watch this space and see how it develops. Right on. <clears throat> well, let's move on. What? So, what? What kind of stuff were you into as a kid? What? Uh, what did you enjoy doing? I enjoyed like anything to do, uh, like laptop, anything about the military, guns, aircraft, especially. Like I had this thing about military aircraft that could identify all sorts of stone and nuclear weapons. Like read up on nuclear. I was fascinated with nuclear technology and weapons and. Um, Where did that inspiration come from? I have no idea. Movies? Yeah, there was some, like the, 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 the one, there's two movies, sorry, well, there's a whole group of movies that inspired me, but one of the key ones, The Wild Geese. I remember watching The Wild Geese. Have you seen it? I haven't. You need to watch it. And I said this, I've said it in a previous interview, if you haven't watched The Wild Geese, it's, it's an, it's an, it hasn't aged very well, but it's got like, um, Richard Burton, Roger Moore, um, Richard Harris—they're the, they're the, the main stars in it. It's—it was I think it's nineteen seventy-seven, um, but it's it's about mercenaries who free fall into Africa to rescue a, a tribal leader. Really? And uh, yeah, so it's um, and um, I saw that and went, I that that it filled my heart that and it's um. um so that was the main. That if he said what what movie of all movies inspired you to be in the military it would be the Wild Geese. Is, is that that is it? Um, and for anyone out there who's into movies or making movies, I should say, just hear me out here. That is dying to be made into a modern modern movie, dying because yeah. uh, it ticks a lot of boxes as well. Even in even in this age, it's a it. If you made that into a TV show or a movie, just say I'm just giving you that gift. Yeah, go and go and look them up. Wild Geese and say, let's make a modern, uh, a modern version of this is good. And then Who Dies Wins? Have you seen that movie? I haven't. What, who dies when? Who dies wins? Like the the motto of the SES. It's about a SES guy who goes undercover in a in an anti nuclear movement, and the and then these terrorists who he, he's uh, undercover with. Um. Um take over the US Embassy in London and then at the end of it there's a SES hostage rescue mission and it's Lewis Collins it's it's just that movie has inspired so many young men to join the SES of, of my of my, my my age group interesting it's, yeah it's a it's a great movie it's a great movie what about Bravo 2-0 yeah I was in the army when that came out oh okay so I was already committed you're already in there yeah and then uh, yeah and the, but then there's all the other movies again it this strange thing of, because we're going to talk about this later on, is what is the, like, Commando? I, I, if someone said, what movie have you seen more than any other movie? It would be Commando. But and First Blood Part Two again, I've talked about it before, is how much of an influence First Blood Part Two was. But what... Commando. Rambo. Demolition Man. All the classics. Passenger 57. Like, all these uh, die hard. What's, what's the formula? Bad guys do some shit. 
lone man turns up, sorts them out. Sometimes reluctantly, sometimes against orders. It's strange, isn't it? How, and I think that's why there's a lot of popular. That why my incident is so popular. Yeah, because it's playing into this. Like this is what we grew up on. And 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 so maybe it's a thank you to Sylvester Stallone to Arnold Schwarzenegger to all these people who helped me help with my training. Um, because maybe it is a thing. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick break, and then when we come back. We'll get into what got you in the military, how old you were, where you went. Did you know that one in five Americans have learn a new language on their bucket list? It's true. If that's you, check it off your bucket list this year, because with Babbel, you can start speaking a new language, foreign language, in about three weeks. Why Babbel? Because it works. Instead of paying hundreds of dollars for a private tutor or fooling yourself with language apps that are a little more than games, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language, just like I said, in as little as three weeks. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. To get you started right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash SRS. With over 10 million subscriptions sold, Babbel is real language learning for real conversations. Get 55% off babbel.com slash SRS. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash SRS. Rules and restrictions apply. Visit babbel.com for terms and details. Here's the situation. You've got China, Russia, Ukraine, the border. The banks seem to be collapsing. Plus, the Chinese just negotiated with Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil to drop the U.S. dollar. And most Americans, including myself, feel that we're in a recession right now. But despite all the evidence, I can't tell you what's going to happen for sure. Nobody can. Yet when it comes to your money, you should understand what's at stake. That's why I partnered with Gold Co. to possibly help at times like this. Go to SeanLikesGold.com or call 855-936-GOLD to get your free gold and silver kit. The kit shows you how to defend your money with precious metals and how listeners of the show could get up to $10,000 in bonus silver. Go to SeanLikesGold.com or call 855-936-GOLD to get your free gold and silver kit. I can't predict the future, but I can certainly prepare for it. So go to SeanLikesGold.com or call 855-936-GOLD now. Performance may vary. Consult with your tax attorney or financial professional before making an investment decision. All right, Christian, we're back from the break. We're getting ready to dive into some of your military career. But first... What was the inspiration to join so young? You had a, if I correct me if I'm wrong, 28-year military career. You joined when you were 16 years old. Why did you join so young? What was happening in the world? It, it, was, it wasn't so much what was going on in the world. It was going on in my world. I just had to get into the Army. As I mentioned earlier, I didn't really enjoy childhood. Mm-hmm. All I was doing was waiting to grow up. And the earlier, the earliest I could get into the army, that's when that's when I was going to jump at it and join the army when I was sixteen. So that's yeah. Did you have any idea what you wanted to do in Abs- the army? Absolutely, I knew straight away. I don't. I knew I wanted to join the parachute regiment. Which, if you wanted to do um, comparisons, it's the Ranger Battalion. Okay. And uh, I was I wanted to join the parachute regiment, and that was it. There was no not. I was set. Lots of people, including all of my family, didn't think I was going to be able to do it. The, the, they didn't want you to do no, it? No, they didn't think I'd be able to do it because it, it's, it's hard to become a power trip. It's hard training. Mm-hmm. And I was a skinny, skinny little guy who looked young. And people were like, there's no way he's going to get into the paras. We have a, there's a test called P Company. It's kind of like Hell Week. And uh, there was a... Uh, a few months before I actually enlisted, there was a documentary on the UK TV and everyone was saying, 
that's what Chris is going to do and people are going, he'll never be able to do that. And um, so so people, and, and, and some members of uh, my family, my, my, my aunt was was worried about it because she knew I was fanatical about joining the military and being a warrior. But she was like thinking, well, what's he going to do when he fails? Because like, and that, and that was what people thought. And, and it, it goes back to my grandmother. She knew, she knew like my potential, but everyone else take, takes everything at, at face value. So like, people think Navy SEALs are like six foot five and, yeah, you know, you know the, the whole deal, and like, what? It's like, it's the same thing. People thought paratroopers were all like big, tall, tall, mean, mean men, and like big and gnarly, not young-looking little skinny, skinny guys. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I knew, and I, I went to the army career uh, recruitment office, and uh, then the um, they said, come back and do the the entrance test. Um, you don't need to be very bright to be a paratrooper on on paper. Um, but I, I took the test and, and I completely knocked out of the park. And they were like, wow, you did really well on this, which is is one of those things where you, when you're older, you look back and go, interesting how I didn't do well at school. I didn't apply myself very well at school. But when you do these, um, I come, there's a name that's similar to the US military, you do like a, a the test, you, you score off the charts on it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, and I did really well. And they said, you can do anything you want. You can, and they were saying, if I was you, I would do an apprenticeship in the Royal Signals. You'll get promoted really fast. You'll get a really much more money. Like people want to do this apprenticeships, and I was like, nope, parachute regiment, nope. And they were like, nah. you know, it's been ten years since the Falklands War. Everyone wants to join the join the, the parachute regiment. I'm like, yeah, don't care. And then they they said, well, because it's gonna, there's so many people want to join. The um, it's going to be about a year before you start your training. And I was like, fine, I'll wait. Went home. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. Yeah, you start training in September. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this call in the bluff. And, and, and the message here is for, any, for anyone, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got something in your mind that you want to do, most of the time people trying to talk you out of it haven't got your best interests in mind. So mm -hmm. just stick to your guns. Be stubborn. Nope, nope. And sometimes you might be persuaded because it might be the better thing to do something else. But if you've got a plan, no, I would understand. I'm so because I've I've seen a lot of people in the British Army, and I'm sure it's the same in the U.S. military, where they've went to a recruiting officer, say, "Hey, I want to be a, I want to be a ranger," and they'll say, well, "What you you can do is if you join the engineers, you can still do ranger school, and technically you're a ranger." And they're like, mm -hmm. "Oh, okay." And yeah. then and then they join and 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 they be and they're like I didn't sign up for this I didn't want to be, and they do minimum time and get out. It was the same in the British Army. They'd say do this and lots of people I knew wanted to join the par parachute regiment and they said no, be an engineer, do do be a driver, be a medic. You can still be a paratrooper. And they're just being sold a sold a lie. Interesting. Because because I'm sure it's the same in the U.S. military. These recruiters have got a quota to meet. They say hey, we we desperately need more. Medics, drivers, engineers, infantry, and that's what they're going to try and meet that quota. I believe that's what happened, but but I was just stubborn. So, and then in September 1992, I entered service into the British Army. What? How old do you have to be to? Is it 16, or did you slide in there somehow? No, it's 16. 16, but you can't uh, after. In the Falklands War, some paratroopers who were killed on Mount Longdon in the, the, the battle there were 17 years old. And I think after, so at some point after that, then they said you can't go on combat operations until you're 18 years old. Okay. So, so it's 18. You can so join the Army, but you, can, you can't serve on combat operations until you're 18. So still today, mm -hmm. you can join at age 16. Yes. It's Does very, that mean you're leaving the home? And yeah, I mean, on my last day in the... In the, in the British Army. I went to the Army Foundation College in Harrogate, which is where all the junior soldiers are now, mm -hmm. and I gave them a presentation about what I did in Kenya um, to 640 um, um, recruits, students, whatever you're going to call them. Um, and and things have changed. Now it, 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 I was talking with the Command Sergeant Major, the RSM as we call them, and they do a lot of, like that's what it is, it's Army Foundation. It's building the foundation for young people to have a 
not just a career in the military, but give them the right step up in life. Mm -hmm. So they focus on education. It's still, it's still military training, but it's preparing them for life, life uh, for service, and it, it's 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 good. When I joined in 1992, the army had you had your apprenticeships if you had a trade job. You had the junior leaders. So if you join, like say the guards, the, like the say the household cavalry, like the guards or infantry regiments, they have junior leaders. So it would be a year training, and you people would get command appointments. So you'd be like a junior lance corporal or a junior sergeant major if you were good and things. And and it was again a similar sort of thing. Only exception was the parachute regiment. We had junior para. That's what it's called. And that uh, was, yeah, it's the amount of, I, I was the last ever junior para platoon. And then it, it the shelf the junior army for, I, I might be wrong here, but it was for a year or two or a amount of time. And then they re, re, restarted. And I think everyone does the same training now. But I was the, this was the last platoon of junior para. But the amount of people who went into the SAS or became command sergeant majors from junior para was it, so it was a it was a system that worked they were preparing people and uh, we're going to go like uh, maybe a bit philosophical here but it was brutal mm -hmm. but you know what that's what i wanted mm -hmm. because i'd read about it and the harder the better the more the more the more the thrashing we got the harder the physicality that to me was what it was about because mm -hmm. I was joined, I, I, in my mind, I was, I'm joining the elite. I'm, the, I'm doing the best I can do at my age, and and it was, and it was brutal. It was brutal, and I, I look back now and think, if it'd be hard as a 16 year old to say, would I want that to happen to someone? Part of me would say no, but part of me now is like, yeah, but it has to. Again, it's this conditioning. Yeah. And here's the, but here's the question. Here's the thing, and it's not, it's like an open question to everyone listening to you. As I, as I said earlier, we've got the Army Foundation College that is setting, it's a, like I, I put it in a, in a good light, it's setting young people up for service in the military and in life. Great. Junior para, though, turned me into a warrior. So what do you want? Because you can't have, in my opinion, you can't have both. Mm -hmm. Do you want this 17-year-old, when they graduate, 17 year old you want them to be set up in life you know the the message and that we got now and oh yeah you're going to do well and you can do this and you can drive a car and you can balance your books and you and you've done all do you want them to be a fucking killing machine because that's what you got from junior para yeah it's like i remember writing a letter to my mother saying i i, I asked her when i was researching uh one man in if she had it she couldn't didn't have it but it was saying how for me, I want to die in combat. I want to storm a machine gun position. It's the ultimate honor to be killed fighting from a country. And so it was that sort of, that's what we were wow. saying, saying to me. And it was like that thing of going, yeah. And and that, and that's what you got. And that's why, the, like I said, there's such many, a lot of these people went, ended up in special forces or career soldiers, with the command sergeant major, because it was this thing of like, yeah, you know what, as a paratrooper, where, why, do you, why do you join the army? It's like, I want to jump out of airplanes and kill people. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, mm -hmm. just and it's that rather than going, oh yeah, well I want to get a trade. I want to get some life experience. I want to see the world. Okay, you haven't got you haven't got the mindset to be dropped behind enemy lines. Yeah, and close in with a superior force and kill the queen's enemies. That's the, that's what the view was then, in my opinion. And it was and it was and 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 the instructors were on that line. Boom, boom, like. This is what we're training for. We're training for all our war. There is nothing. Else. And you saw when I used to walk past, you used to walk past, the, the, it was in the guards depot in Southern England and you could see the, like the guards between were allowed to put posters and things up on their, on their walls and pictures of their families and stuff. Nothing. Nothing was allowed in, up on the walls in the junior para block with the exception of one thing was the 10 commandments of the parachute of the German Fallschirmjäger, the German parachute rifleman. Really? Yeah, that's the only thing that was a lot in, in every room on the walls. Do you remember them? Mo most of them. I'm going to get tested. Um, but the things that step out is for you, you are the embodiment, and it changed to British, But because it said the, the Ten Commandments of the of the power troop. You are the embodiment of the British warrior. For you, the fight will be the ultimate goal. 
seek it, always seek it out. What was going on? Oh, in sorry, the world? sorry. Hard as was it? Tough as leather, hard as crooked steel. Agile as a greyhound. You are the embodiment of the British soldier. For you, the fulfilment will be battle. Seek it out wherever you can. Something like that. Wow. Which is the last one, which I think is pretty yeah. hard hurting. And, yeah. and there's other things more controversial. They say, like, be shy of chatter. Men act, women chatter. Chatter will take you to the grave. So it's a. Nice. <clears throat> what, what year is this? 1992. 1992. What was going on in the world then, from um, your perspective? From it was the the main effort from from the UK point of view was just the troubles in Northern Ireland. What kind of troubles? Like the the, the insurgency. So it would be the it was the only deployment the for British troops to go to Northern Ireland, and assist with the policing there, patrol patrolling like the streets of of the of the streets and in, into the rural areas of uh, of Northern Ireland. Did you go there? Mm -hmm. What yeah. kind of stuff are you guys doing? We're just doing like routine patrols. Yeah, anything exciting? Uh, there was a few. They they were big onto the IED things, and, and it's hard to imagine this is still UK and it's yeah. there's still unrest there now. But um, but um, not to me personally, um, but to people in the same company as me, someone got badly injured with a improvised explosive device hit an armored vehicle and things. And this is on the streets of UK. Wow, that's in, crazy. In Northern Ireland, and it was, it, and people were being killed every day. And that's still going on. Sectarian violence. There's, the ceasefire happened in 1995. What is it? What is the? Can you give us some insight into the? I don't know. I want to do it in justice because yeah, it's just like yeah. This is it criminal. What is it's, it? It's what kind the, of organization? Uh, well, it's the you, well, you have the re religious element, the Catholics and the Protestant. Again, apologies to anyone watching this because I'm going to. I'm not doing this any justice, and it's complicated but you have then you have the people who the republicans who want a united ireland that's the ira that's okay the, and then but then you have uh loyalist terrorists who don't want a united ireland and they fight each other and kill each other okay and and, the, and, the, and it went to came to a boiling point in the 1960s are any of these they, government entities entities uh or? Yeah, there is a political win of, a wing of the ira which is Sinn Féin and and um Again, apologies to everyone out there who's watching. Going, yeah, I'm, I'm it's not, okay. I'm not 100, percent and it is. This is just, this is the way that you understand it. Yeah. So, and, and we were, we were just supporting police operations. I mean, I was a young 18 year old, um, young guy on patrol. That's how did it feel? Yeah, it, being it, out there for the first time. Yeah, it was good. Well, <laughs> so we, we, I went to like an operating base in in West Belfast, and. Um, and I was 17 years old when I got there, and we just started like a like a six month, a six week rotation in this patrol base. So I can't go on the ground. So I just so my task when I first get there is I'm the company runner. So I'm sitting in the ops room, making cups of tea and stuff for the people, and get delivering messages because no mobile phones or anything there. And uh, on the uh, and I'd only been there a few days, and then my 18th birthday was coming up. Didn't think anything of it at the time. At the <laughs> So it's day before my birthday and my stick who I've been attached to, they're going out on patrol. And the stick leader's like, Hey, just just hang in the room, watch you're not on you're not doing duty, you don't have to be in the ops room tonight. Just watch a movie and, and get your head down. We'll not we'll not be back till early hours of the morning. I'm like, okay. So I'm watching a movie and then I go to bed. And then at one minute past midnight, the door gets kicked in. And my stick leader's there in all all his gear and says who ended up in the SES himself, like before me, um, he's then going, get, hey, Craighead, get your gear on. We're going out. Like, cause now I'm legal. One minute past, so I put on my full gear and all the police and sticks all waiting for me outside and I went, happy birthday. And then they put in the vehicle, the armored vehicle, we go out on a patrol in the streets. And so that's my, that's like a few minutes into my 18th birthday. Nice. So. Well, what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Again, most of the time in Northern Ireland, it was just maintaining a presence. And how long? Did, how much time did you spend in the regiment? Uh, Fifteen years. Fifteen years. Yeah. Yeah. And then what? Oh, sorry, in the parachute regiment. Yes. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was. So I was in the second battalion, the parachute regiment, for three years. Okay. And then I volunteered to go into Pathfinder Platoon. And Pathfinder Platoon is, again is in a, it's the brigade reconnaissance force for the Airborne Brigade. It's very similar. The, the the equivalent in the US would be Force Recon. Okay. Um, so very, very hard selection to get in, fast and furious selection. 
um, do the same hills as as what you do on like in the Brecon Beacons, running around there, navigating on your own. Um, and then once you're in there, you do high altitude low opening parachute descents and specialist training. They had M16s at the time when M16A2s, when the British Army was still on the SA80 weapon. So it was kind of it's like a poor man's special forces. Okay, what year is this? This is 1996. 1996. And that and that first year in Pathfinder Platoon was probably one of the best years of my life. I had so much so much fun. It was just a good experience. At the, I'm sure it was 1997, they got a sergeant major and things went bad then because before it was like a band of rogues and the sergeant major thing, it's not a, it's not a point of a sergeant major, not the, it's not to bad mouth the sergeant major, but beforehand, I think the command didn't have a point of contact to say, you need to tell your guys to get a haircut. You need to go, you got to wear SU equipment. So when, when the, with the emergence of a sergeant major, the, the brigade headquarters now then had a, a point of contact, so things stopped being fun. And 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 almost just after a year of getting into Pathfinders, I then had a really bad accident, road accident. Mm-hmm. Which, this is in 1997. 1997. So this is a major. Yeah. This is a turning point in your life. Yes, I think again, it's one of those things. What did it have to have to happen? Probably, and it wasn't very nice, but um. But I was badly, like badly injured. What happened? Um, well, we were driving up onto onto a mountain training exercise in in Scotland, and on the on a motorway, one sort of truck pulled out in front of another. The drug, the guy driving it. Oh, I was in a Land Rover in the back of a Land Rover. He swerved, kind of lost control of the vehicle, or a vehicle because there's no witness because most people died. So that's what they think happened. Land Rover rolled down the hill. Um, I was catapulted out of the back of the Land Rover. I was in a sleeping bag, and that saved my life because as the Land Rover went flat, one of the trucks rolled on top of the Land Rover and crushed it, killing the driver, another Pathfinder instantly, and trapping another Pathfinder in the uh, passenger seat who, who 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 was injured but not that badly. And then I was catapulted out into onto the into a tree, and then they found me when the emergency service turned up. They found me in the tree. Apparently, in a sleeping bag, and I would bust up. Yeah, you know. So, um, um, I keep on forgetting one, one of the terms, but um, so I, uh, I dislocated my hip. So, got a leg pulled out of its socket in my in my hip. I broke um, ribs on my uh, one of the sides, this side, my right side. Broke ribs there. Had a tension hemorrhorothorax. So things were getting bad there. Yeah. Um, broke my collarbone, my shoulder blade, um, my jaw, my cheek, my skull. And then I had a bleed on the brain. I had a, either a subdural hematoma or extradural hematoma. On, on different medical reports, they say different things. So basically, I had a bleed on the brain, life-threatening. I also broke my neck in three places and my back in seven places. So I was in a, I was in a bad way. Yeah. I was pretty poorly. And um, they rushed me to hospital. And then um, they, they notified my mother and my stepdad and they came down and they said to my mother, he's not going to you know, prepare. They put me on the ward where he's like, he's in life support now. We moved him into the ward where, yeah, be prepared that he, he's gone. And then uh, at some point I was resuscitated twice. And then, and then I, and then, and then I was in a coma for three weeks. Two, Three two, weeks. Two, two, two and a half weeks, and then I came out of it, and then, uh, and I came out of the coma, and I'm in the in, in the recovery ward, and they've taken all like luckily I was in, in so I was in a coma for most of the time, so I'm, so I didn't really feel any. I got out of it. I got a, I got away with it lightly, so I didn't have to. And I had traction on my leg when I woke up, and my neck was kind of there were fractures, but they were all stable, so I didn't have to have any of these halos or anything on. And I, I get, I'm in the recovery ward, and I get a phone call. The nurse says, "Oh, there's someone phoning you at the desk." So I, they're taking the traction off. So I hobble down, and they say, "Yeah, make sure you're at work. Make sure you're back at work in like two weeks' time after Christmas." So it was, like, it was about four weeks, and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> and it wasn't even that long ago. It's 1997, and I didn't have any rehab at all for this. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> 
and it's like no rehab. I didn't even get downgraded on my military docs. I was just like no rehab, and it was just like make yourself better. And then eventually, I did my I did my first jump five months afterwards. And the first jump I did was a um, from I think it was I looked at my logbook. It was eighteen thousand feet with full operational loadout and carrying a GPMG strapped to my side. That's the first jump I did after that five months later, and I shouldn't have done it. But you young young guy then, I'm like twenty three, going yeah, I'm good. How are you, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm not good. Yeah, but I'm gonna do it. And uh, I suffered a bit with my back for a few years after that, and then then, I mean, but it's fine now. Touch wood. Um, but that that's that that was weird because that's a thing of I always say to people who are injured now is like make sure you're fit. Like don't no one's gonna thank you for it. No yeah. one's gonna thank you for like putting yourself on the line again early. Make sure you're recovered. But here's the other thing as well is I wasn't right because of maybe the bleed on the brain. I f so my memory when I think about what I was doing in in that 1997 into 1998 until about ten months afterwards I wasn't right wasn't right in the head and I thought I was right. It's like people who are, do people who are or people who are insane do they know they're insane? No, it's a same. I'd say that I'd get into fights. I'd be like. And it, and then eventually I it just came I got better, but it was um but yeah it was it it and, and again I'm not throwing dirt but I was definitely mismanaged mm -hmm. definitely they they thought again they thought it was I keep on saying it again they they thought it would have been better for my welfare to be down in work in a but it's a military town so I'm always going out pretty much most nights drinking and fighting and stuff so it's like that kind of thing it's all shot in the nineties. It's, um, it's good and bad. So, but the best thing, we, what they should have really done is just stay at home. In hindsight, it would have been just stay at home, get fit, have some home cooking. Yeah. Family look after you, keep you right. That's what they should have done. Mm -hmm. Because the, in their like view is come down and the army would keep me right. But the army doesn't keep you right. It just, I was just left with yeah. the guys again. So, but yeah, but I re recovered from it and. <clears throat> I know you were you were in the Iraq invasion, correct, mm -hmm. in two thousand three. Yeah. Let's rewind just a little bit to nine eleven, two thousand one. Yeah. <clears throat> this is an interesting conversation, I think, because I've never asked a a foreign special operator what it was like on nine eleven from their perspective. And so I'd like to ask you on September 11, 2001, what, where were you and what was going through your head? Um, I was in the jungle when it happened, so I didn't hear about it initially. I was actually on selection. It was a selection that I was on. I was an SS selection that I failed. I didn't, um, well, I did fail. I didn't pass it, but I got injured in the jungle. I got injured, I think it was on 9-11, um, got kazivac out. I was all right, but the, the train officer wouldn't let me go back into the jungle. So I was then said, come back another time. Mm -hmm. So I was, and then it's only when I got out from the hospital, having been checked up, then it was still on the news. It was like, and everyone's just like, what the hell? But the thing is people like, it's like the common phrase was, this is like, well, it's like watching a movie. Is this really happening? And um, so there was that feeling of, wow. And people don't say in UK and then, I think it's quite sad to say people in the UK I felt when I got back, no one was really it didn't it didn't burn itself into society like it did in the United States. People mm -hmm. were aware of it. Yeah. But it didn't it didn't see it, you know, that searing sort of yeah. we're under attack mentality like focus. It was just oh it's another incident. That's how I view it was felt in, mm -hmm. in UK. It wasn't like this energized. There was, certainly wasn't people joining up the military going, right, I've just saw 9-11. Yeah. Let, let's time to gear, it's time to gear up or whatever. It's that it didn't have that effect. Did it go through your head that you were probably going to go to war? Uh kind of. I was very focused on getting into the into the unit. So I was like uh, and but uh but but that it's only in hindsight. Did I realize that was a that was a turning point for my life as well? Because that's when up until 9-11, I 
done a couple of deployments with Pathfinders into the Balkans and into, into and Sierra Leone. But that's when up and up and but they. So how do how do I frame this? Is that I had a life up until nine eleven. I'd always go back to my hometown a lot, and I, then I'd meet my guys that I know from my hometown and go out and socialize and meet people. That's when things got real because that's when I went realized what was wrong when I was nearly retiring. Yeah, it's from 2001. That's when I stopped going home because things got busier. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for me, there wasn't much going. Like we were just in the unit. We, our first deployment was 2003. So we didn't respond. Uh, although Pathfinders did go to um, uh, Afghanistan in 2002, 2001. But I was, I was back on, I was going on selection that got called off at the last moment. But um, but yeah. So but then that's when things got real, and then I, but then I joined the army. In, uh, sorry, joined the the unit in two thousand. What is it? I mean, so you deployed as a ally to the United States, mm-hmm. correct? I mean, what is like, what is what was the briefing? You know, what it? I guess, what is it like to go to war? for something that happened to a country that you're not a part of? I think it all comes back to how the mainstream media and the politicians frame things, isn't it, about this? We're going because of the weapons of mass destruction. We're part of a allied task force to rid the world of evil. That kind of message, isn't it? So it wasn't... I think most British soldiers didn't think they were going there to, in support of the... Of, United States. Okay. They're going as part of a task force, which is the United States and other countries were included. What did it, I mean, but it's stuck. I've seen you guys there the entire time, Mm -hmm. you know, in the Iraq theater, in the Afghanistan theater. I mean, did it become apparent that that the U.S. is going to drag this war on and on and on? No, I think, I think people get, I think people just get, most soldiers, the average like time span of people in the military isn't long career soldiers, but mm-hmm. people just like go with it. it a lot of it, for myself, it's more hindsight. You think, wow, how did that happen? Yeah. Think what was, was the what was the pulse of just the UK in general? I mean, Europe was Europe was very critical of every move that the US made in the, in both of those wars. However, most of them took part. Yeah, in the, the war, the media, were, as far as I'm aware, were pretty supportive of going to war and support our troops. Really, and things. I apologies if I'm wrong. No, but I was, but I was there. So I mean, I was yeah. deploying, so I didn't really get it. So that I, I, I'm not really seeing the newspapers because I'm deployed. So mm-hmm. that's what I think happened. But um, I may be wrong. But um, it, but people might be calling me wrong, and they're just working on in hindsight. Going, no, no, no. We all, no one wanted to go to war. Tony Blair took us into an illegal war, blah, blah, blah. But I suggest that you maybe weren't saying that at the time. Now you're just saying it in hindsight because you know information and that's easy to do. And we'll talk about an incident later on as people talk about an incident. Remember, people, when you're doing it, you don't know the outcome. Same Same as when people think about these weapons of mass destruction, whether at the time people thought they existed. Mm hmm. So it's easy now to point fingers and say we shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Um, but. I mean, what was the pulse of your, your unit? Were you guys excited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, yeah. any, any opportunity um, to go to combat or potential combat is, should be greeted with enthusiasm. Be like, yeah, this is, hopefully this will be it. The, the two deployments done before, we hadn't really seen any combat. When I say combat, I'm using the term combat. Shooting an exchange of gunfire isn't necessarily combat, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So, so, but like, um, as a lot of people in Iraq and Afghanistan will find out in the future that you know that then it was it was like on. Mm-hmm. Some guys in the British Army had some real, real tough fights, but um, but at that time it was kind of an unusual thing. Two thousand going into two thousand three, there hadn't been this. How long had it been since the regiment had been at, at, at war? Where were you guys drawing uh, so your I wasn't experience? in the regiment in 2003. 
Okay. This is I'm still in Pathfinder between. Pathfinder. What where I guess what I'm asking is where were you guys drawing your experience from? Oh, so, yeah. Um again every sorry, it's a sorry, I'm getting confused because sometimes people most people call the reg I call the unit I call the the SES the unit, but a lot of people call the SES the regiment. Okay. So when you sometimes I meant when you say the regiment. Yeah. Um uh, but from the um from or the, anyone from the parachute, the, the last sort of proper scrapping war was the Falklands War in 1982. So you're drawn from 1982 experience in 2001. Well, 20 2000, year old and then, but then when they went to Afghanistan, they weren't. It wasn't. It was the different Afghanistan. So 2003 was when we, this army's deploying to um, Iraq to, mm -hmm. to to the to invade Iraq. Um, do, do you understand what I'm asking? So. So, in with the SEAL teams when we yeah. went in, you're drawing off experience from very like, real world operations. I mean, there was some stuff that went down in Panama and Colombia, yeah, right? There was a couple of SEALs on the ground in Somalia. There wasn't a whole lot of experience, like real experience to draw from. Exactly the same thing. You had a lot of experience of peacetime that, and, that's, and that was the same thing in, in the army I joined because as much as the, they were super professional and dedicated instructors and in training none of them had seen any combat yeah with the exception of uh, in junior para one in, one one corporal was in the Falklands and one of the and this platoon sergeant was in the Falklands but the others were talking about yeah he, kill 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 but none of them had done it before mm -hmm. so it was it's interesting when you think about it like and I think that's where the military is heading now is we've got a whole like generation of instructors who missed the boat on the war on terror yeah and 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 are, draw, and, and are drawing on experience of like so now they're teaching on opinion rather than an experience yeah well this is a whole nother this is a whole nother direction that we can go into but i i mean personally i believe here in the u.s i don't i can't speak for anywhere else i believe that they are actively trying to get rid of all of the wartime experience mm -hmm. and that entire mindset. That's that's why you're seeing the forced vaccinations. That's why you're seeing the woke agenda. Yeah. That's why you're seeing forced in what are they called? Inclusivity. Yeah. You know, all of these things. Nobody joins the military to deal with that kind of shit. Yeah. You know, and they it, join the military to defend their country and go to war, fight and go to battle. Mm -hmm. For their country, it seemed like a mark of shame if you say that nowadays. Mm -hmm. You say, "What do you want to do? I want to go to war." Oh, and like all of the recruitment adverts are all based around either woke agenda or it's about peace, like peacetime op type operations, like support and influence. Yes, they're important. Yeah, but you, but it's always like that sort of narrative, not full on. There's no pride in it. Full anymore. on, the Russians are attacking. Yeah, Let's, it's World War Three. Let's go. Not none of that. It's and it's like I'm and, and, and I suspect I can only speak for myself and people might strongly disagree with this, but it's like a mark of shame now if you were served in if you said oh yeah I was in the war on terror, mm -hmm. it's like oh we don't talk about that. That's yeah. just, that's not what we're about. Yeah, we're we're, we're getting really good it, at erasing history. It cost, it cost me and every a lot of other people a lot of things. But, um, Recruiting um, numbers are down in the UK. I believe well. so. Yeah. 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 There are, and especially into the um, I I'm, I don't know firsthand, but I someone said there was an article recently that recruitment into special forces or the tier one special forces is at an all time low as well. Yeah, apparently I might be wrong, but apparently it's. I know for a fact it is here, but it it, it seems like it's, it's just because it's a message. It's a message. It's like where your action movies, all these con. It's like training from the minute you're born. Now you have a generation of people, not all, but this is the generation, well, why would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a high chance of death, high risk. Do I get paid more? Not really. Why would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. It's just strange. It's actually a good question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, <laughs> bragging rights, isn't it? Well, it's, it's for like, it's bragging rights. This is the biggest motive. Eagles are brilliant. It's, that's what it's for. It's like, why do you want to do it? Well, so I can see I'm a Navy SEAL. I mean, looking, <laughs> like, looking at it, like, like oh. listening to what you're saying, I'm hearing it, and I'm like, actually, this is just common sense. Yeah, who's the Do monk? I get paid hey, more? No. Why would I want to? <laughs> yeah. Do but, I get paid more? No. Is there a chance of death? Yes. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in. 
Yeah. There's a there's a high chance you do this mission, you're never going to come back to one way mission. Sounds great. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, let's rewind. Let's go back to 2003. So mm-hmm. you deployed for Path- the invasion. Yeah. The Iraq invasion yeah. in 2003 is a yeah. is a pathfinder. Yeah. How many people are you deploying with? In my team, it was a six-man team. That's it. Yeah, six-man and a six-man like reconnaissance team. Um, I didn't when we deployed into across the border. We, I, my uh, patrol wasn't employed, as so we was drove over in like the uh, cut down Land Rovers across with the main force, and then waited. We waited for a mission. Um, I was quite a. I was held in very high regard by the officer commanding of Pathfinders, and he was saying, "I'm I'm not going to employ you yet." waiting for the right job for you, which was frustrating for me and frustrating for my team. And um, But then I got a job and it was good. What was it? It was good. It was a close target reconnaissance of an Iraqi armoured division. So it meant getting close to the Iraqi armoured division, on foot, going in and getting as close as you can, trying to work out numbers, routine, and also look at there was a like a MSR like a a, a, a road behind the armor division. There's also a secondary mission was to check the quality of the road and what condition it was in and and, and that that kind of vibe and general mm-hmm. a- atmospherics of the area. So this is so Pathfinders is a reconnaissance yeah. element. Yeah, is there a sniper element as well? The 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 snipers in in every team. There's a sniper okay. in every team. So for my, for this mission, it was like. You're gonna. There's four thousand um, Iraqi troops in this armored division. Four thousand. You guys and, are. And it's me conducting it's six, surveillance. Six man team, no air support. Um, Whoa. And it's. Um, I've got. I've, I was a JTAC at the time. I was the team leader, and I, and I carried the radio in, in case we, if we needed air support, we'd do a nine line, and it would. But it wasn't overhead. It would be chalked to us if we needed it. And I had to think about this. It was, and it was, I'm, I'm going to say this to everyone. It's a true story and it doesn't mean everything I say is, is bullshit, but it was, it was a good mission. And the OC actually said to me, you don't have to do this because it's a high, we knew, we kind of worked, they said that you're going to come into contact with the enemy. It's high risk. You don't have to do it. But if you want it, you can do it. And I was like, of course I'm going to do it. There's like, yeah. So I then came up with the plan. And because of the... Uh, Did you say, I better get it paid more? <laughs> yeah. No. What? Is it, there's a high chance of dying? Yeah. Yes. But it was... I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> um, but so so my how I'm doing this is we're going to um, use another patrol to um, what we'll call a sponsor patrol. So we drove to like a release point and so we got given this operations box around this armored division and you had three para... Third battalion, the parachute. Their sniper team was on, looking at the bottom bit, and then the armored reconnaissance was looking into the top bit. And then my team was going to go into the actual hornet's nest. Um, the sponsor patrol saw so all in all, f- there'd be two vehicles from my team and two vehicles from the sponsor patrol would go to a release point, and then I would leave my vehicles behind, and then go in on foot. So the sponsor and and because of noise, I didn't want to take six people. There, so I said, I'm going to go with three people, me and two others. So we then work out who's going to do it. So I go in, I've got my the Army SU SA rifle with a 40 uh, mic mic grenade launcher underneath. I've got the radio for the aircraft. I then take Paddy, who was actually my second in command, brilliant sniper. He's going in with a sniper rifle. Me, and the reason for that is um, when we get to a, a point where we're going to approaching on foot, Paddy would then set up with his sniper rifle give overwatch, whilst me and a guy called Larry would then go in two of us towards the armoured vehicles and, and 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 try and scope it out. So less people, less movement, less noise. And Larry, who's get, uh, ended up into, into the SES as well, um, brilliant soldier, brilliant mindset. He had the M249, the Minimi. And so we had as much, and we had uh, hand grenades and, and Browning high power pistols. So we're we're taking as much firepower as we can for three men. 
So we, on the first night, we have a, a bit of an incident. One of the vehicles rolls and the second in command of Pathfinders, an officer, gets badly injured. And, he, and so that's the mission gets scrubbed that night. Next night, just reset and do it again. This time, everything goes well. We get to the release point and then we, the three of us set off on foot into, the, um, into this armoured division. The going from the release point to the towards it is terrible. There's like like mounds of mud, every like mud mounds, and it was so uh, bad going. Um, so I should add as well for that night we blacked out all our faces, not like camouflage cream, not blackface. So we just like and and my my theory was because I'd heard it from an experienced SES guy years earlier, who who taught me a lot, was that. If you come face to face with the enemy, it gives you like a, a good edge having camouflage cream on, and, mm-hmm. and I and we sort of knew we were going to come into contact with the enemy, and like before we left, we stripped down our weapons, cleaned the magazines, everything because it was like a, a given. People were very envious that we were going to do it because we knew. So we set off on foot, and it's the going is so bad, like really bad. So I, I again have to make a command decision, but I'm going to run it through these these two guys who I hold in the highest regard. So I'm going to say, look, we're not going to meet. We're going to if we continue to go on this course, we're not we're not going to get there in time. And worst case, we'll be trapped in the daylight in the open. I said. So what I suggest is we get onto this track. You know the rules. We don't walk on tracks, but we get on this track, move down the track at pace up until there was some a set of power lines crossing it. I said that we'll use that power lines as a as a mark and then get off the track and then move towards the armored division you're happy with that because it's moving on track track and i know but i think it's the best idea and they're like absolutely it's the best call so get on the track i'm number one larry with the minimize is number two and paddy at the back with the sniper rifle and then we're moving down this that moving down the track as we're approaching um like there's like so there's on the right hand side of this track there's a berm about six feet high, all the way down, as you as you see in the Middle East a lot. And um, moving down the track, and I see the power lines, and just as I'm about to break off the power lines to go off us, the, the my uh, day sack with my packings ache in my arms, and I stop to adjust it. And as I stop, I hear whispering to my right hand side. I'm like, so I hear whispering to my right hand side. I'm like, in Arabic. So I slowly, slowly like, turn, and I'm like that. And we had no vision goggles on, like to the two other guys, I'm like that. Like thumbs down, like enemy, like there. Mm-hmm. And then, and then um, Larry's like stops, pause, and like, sp- like silently swings straight away to cover. And the distance is about we're about eight yards apart. That's it. Uh, from from the, from each of the three of us. So there's like eight, eight yards to me, Larry, and then eight, about eight yards back to um, Paddy. But the the berm is about from me to your way, and the whispering's on the other side of it. So I'm like, and um, and I'm like, uh, to Larry and Paddy, and they slowly walk up. And then as we, as he gets, I'm like, there's whisper, whisper, whispering off the other side of the berm. Like, because it's this thing when the message was like, you can't engage the enemy unless you're getting engaged or like thing. And I'm like, and then all of a sudden, I don't know if it's because of the movement, the whispering, someone stands up behind the berm. Instantly, I reach up, lean, lean up, and and, um, and up, uh, take a shot. One shot, and my weapon jams. Then I go into trance, trance state. I don't freeze out. I'm like, boom, he goes down, but my weapon stopped. Don't know why, I just run a, like, straight down to my vocal pocket, pull out a high explosive grenade, run over the berm. Sorry, I'm missing a bit out. Bef- before the, uh, as they close up, I then silently go to the berm and look over the top with my night vision goggles on. And I can see around about eight to 12 Iraqi soldiers all in a huddle talking to each other and stuff. So I think where the, where the um, power lines was, it was like a, they were using that as a, like we were as a marker and it was like mm-hmm. a standing patrol or a sentry position. Then I close down and then I say eight to 12 Iraqi army army soldiers uh, behind the berm. And I don't know if it's because they heard the movement or they heard my voice. And then guy stands up, take the shot, he goes down. 
Or, so you killed him? I don't know. I don't know if I hit him. Well, I probably hit him, but I don't know if I killed him. It was one shot with, gotcha. you know, with NATO ammo, but he goes down. I then run up with the high explosive grenade and throw it down into the, uh, into all the Iraqis. That detonates and there's a bit of a scream and there's still threat to life and they're all there and I run and I pull out my brown high pistol, power power pistol, and I, um, and I, uh, uh, um, shoot five of them. So it's like a chaos drill. Bup, 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 bup. And um, on, onto my uh, left-hand side, Larry's there. He's making music with his M249. He's dealing with threats. And then and then um, Paddy with a sniper rifle, he's then throwing hand grenades to potential depth position. Wow. And uh, so this is my first experience of using lethal force. And... Um, and there's a lot of takeaway points from this. So then, when, so then I'm like, okay, let's go. And um, um, I'm like, let's let's go. I quickly, uh, quickly clear that stoppage. What I think had happened is the cocking handle on a SA moves back and forth, and when I fired that first round, it caught on my like loose um, black jacket. And then, um, so that then. Um, so the, all threats have been neutralized. Like I said, they all like recognized straight away. Firstly, when we set up, and then when we took the shot and when we went over the top and the detonators, they were still, like, you know, what high explosive grenades like. It's not like the movies where everyone gets blown. It's like more of a stung. But people were there. Weapons, threat to life. We were in the middle of it. We're a war. So then we I engaged five of them, and then and, and take them down, and then like I said, what, what, all the other things go on. I then say, right, let's go. Used to move back. And I'll cover. So we then do the one. I'm like holding it. They're running back, running, moving back. Um, I fired a 40 mil grenade just, just, just beyond the position, just to deter any sort of follow up. And then, um, then I said, right, get on the road and let's fucking go. Um, so we did a couple of bounds, and then it was turn and then run. And to all these doubters in the military, you say when you do combat fitness tests and you got your gear and you got to run fast for two miles. It's for things like this, mm -hmm. and we're running. And we run to the emergency extraction point or the emergency rendezvous. Um, um, get there. Larry, uh, sorry, uh, Paddy then sets up his sniper rifle. So looking down, hopefully, the, we're hoping there's going to be a follow-up. And um, But then I'm on the radio, yeah, send a contact report, asking for the sponsor patrol to come and pick us up. And then we're waiting in the dock. And um, it's funny because... Larry's like cursing into himself quietly under his mouth, going, "Why the fuck aren't they coming?" <laughs> like he's like, and that's why we're all angry that they're not following us. I mean, why aren't they? Why aren't they trying to attack us? Why aren't they coming after us? Because we're again, it's that mindset. We want this armored division. There's this strange mentality. We want the armored division to mobilize and come come at us. Mm -hmm. And um, so, eventually, the sponsor patrol gets here and we get extracted out. And then uh, back to all the way back to the headquarters, get there for like first, and obviously it's talk of the town because people are saying, oh, well, they've had close quarter engagement. Yeah. And uh, and it's all good, and we get ready to go in the next night. So it's like, so mission kind of failure because we got compromised, but they say we're happy to go in the next night to establish, uh, and this time the next night we'd go in and put an observation post in. We'd still do the CTR, but then do the observation post. But the, the takeaway point where it was like, um, so like preparation that my the reactions that I did and same as Paddy and Larry they were critical because we kind of because we kind of knew we were going to get into a fight the odds are it was like almost certain we were, and everyone knew that Brigade Headquarters everyone knew that so we were keyed in to that I often think if that had been a routine patrol and we'd stumbled across the enemy in such a way. Would we have reacted? Would our would we have, mm. would we have been so keyed up? And it's the good point is that's what I'm saying to anyone who carries a gun, whether it be law enforcement, military, or civilians. Do you think you're going to kill someone today? And they're like a lot of the time I'm saying no. I'm saying why not? You're carrying a gun. Someone thinks that you you're such a threat that you you need to carry a gun or you think you're a threat and you need to carry a gun. So you really should be thinking you're going to have to use lethal force today. Otherwise, why are you carrying it? 
to mm-hmm. me seems illogical. But again, it's and what I'm what's that around? It's not it sound like a psychopath. It's so it's like have your head in the game. Yeah. Earlier to what, what from what something I said earlier about seeing the signs, knowing and like. Anyone who pulls a trigger with a surprised look on their face and never usually ends well. So it's that whole thing. You see it coming, you see the signs, you get prepared, you get your head in the game. And this could be taking place over milliseconds. Mm-hmm. But that's the, the, the good point of that. That is a damn good point. That's a that's a hell of a first engagement. It Rifle was, malfunctions. Mm-hmm. You go up, you use a fragmentation grenade, and then you kill five people with a pistol. What is it like going home after that? What's it like going home after that? Yeah, I mean, to me... When did it register? Oh, straight away, but... It's... For me, it was like, what happened? I used... I mean... It... it, I went went to sleep that night. This... Maybe... We're going to circle back to this later on when we talk about faith. Because there's something happened in between. Um, But... After, what happened in between? Let's just do okay. It. Let's so so I go to the ops room. I like what happened is I had an, a close court engagement with the enemy. Things went wrong. I performed. It was kill or be killed, and I did my job. And it was all this thing, as we all know in the military. Oh, do you think you could really kill a man? Do you think you could do that? How do you think you do in combat? It came to me close quarters, closer than what or the same probably the same distance that I am to you was the engagement range, and. It was high stress, high speed incident. And not only did I perform well, but Paddy, my two IC, and Larry all performed like, like, boom, boom, boom. And it was a good feeling, great feeling. You know, I was tested in the ultimate way, close quarter combat, and we won. And we and we live. And we and we and we fight another day. That's what it's to me is a, a good feeling. Mm-hmm. So I get to the brigade headquarters. The brigadier wants to up, update everything like that. And I'm talking to them. People are shaking my hands in good job, things like that. I then see the padre, who's a friend of mine. At this point, I don't feel any guilt. So I have no guilt about it at all. I don't feel, and I still to this day don't feel bad about it. It's like, again, it's a combat experience. And I see the, I see the padre and I look. And all of a sudden, I feel this well of emotion inside me. Do you know when you do you know when you do something bad at school or when you're a child and you see your parents and you think, oh, and your bottom lip starts shaking or whatever. It was like that. And he kind of must have saw that. And he and he knew I was a, a man of faith. And he and he said to me, he said, um, Chris, do you want to come take communion? Right now. And I went, yeah. So we went to a makeshift. Made a makeshift sort of altar, if you like, and then he did like he did like took holy communion, and and I'm there on my knees, and it felt like I had my eyes closed, praying, and it felt like someone had moved this halogen sort of light above me, and turned it on, and I could feel this light and warmth going through me as I took communion. It was like, I could feel it. It's like, I could feel it. And and not only could I feel it, it's like literal light. There was a light above me. Even though my eyes were closed, it was like bright as if someone had put a searchlight above me and I could feel the heat off the light running through my body. Wow. And I opened my eyes and the Padre looks at me and says, did you feel that? And I'm like, yeah. I goes, I thought it might just be me. He went, no. He goes, sometimes you, I goes, sometimes there's moments when you are close to God and we were close to God right now. What did that feel like after he said that? Yeah, it was, it was, it, it, it it's a bit of a punk because I think it enlightened me. It felt like I was, it felt like I had laser focus. It felt like I was, I felt clean, if that makes sense. I felt like I could breathe. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know a bit like if you've been on a spa day or something? It was mm-hmm. like walking out of a spa day. 
and then I and then I went to this is where it maybe gets a bit lowbrow. I then went did a report, went to where we were my team was sleeping, got in my sleeping bag, zipped it up, and went and as I was falling asleep, falling to sleep, it was like I it was a little boy who just had the best Christmas present ever. Because as I said earlier, I'd been tested in combat and me, like friends and I had all been tested. We all and we all we all won. We won. We we were put into the in in the into the hornet's nest, face to face with the enemy, and we got out of there and we we did we did a good job. So it was like, yeah. Was that the first time in your life that you had really felt that close to God? Yes, it's one of yeah, like it's one was of the, right yeah, there. Yeah. So two first experiences within twenty four hours, probably within yeah. less than twenty four hours, yeah. correct? Well, within within four hours. Within four, four hours, hours of each yeah. other, yeah. you had taken another man's life for the first time and felt the presence of God. Well, extremely close to you. Extremely close. I think I felt him, the presence of God before that. Do you think that's a coincidence? No. No. Why do you think that happened at that point in time? I think it was. It was part. It's all part of a. It's the like. Every time I move away from faith, I get pulled back in. So. Let's take a break. Yeah. When I first started this whole podcasting thing, an online store was about as far from my mind as you can get. And now, most of you already know this, but I'm selling Vigilance Elite gummy bears online. We actually have an entire merch collection that's coming soon. And let me tell you, it is so easy because I'm using a platform that is extremely user-friendly, and that's Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. What I really like about Shopify is it prompts you all the things that you want to do with your web store, like connect your social media accounts, write blog posts, just have a blog in general. Shopify actually prompts you to do this. You want people to leave reviews under your items? You can do that on Shopify. It's very simple. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to the other leading commerce platforms. Shopify is a global force for millions of entrepreneurs in over 175 countries and power 10% of all e-commerce platforms here in the United States. You can sign up right now for $1 a month, it's shopify.com slash Sean. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash Sean now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash Sean. The media is crumbling, and it's crumbling extremely fast by the day. Why? Because everybody knows they're hiding something. People are beginning to realize they have been lied to for years and years, everywhere you look, it's lies. Even the institutions that we all thought that we could trust are turning out to be liars. But now we know. So what do we do? We start to prepare. You also know that the time to prepare for what's coming is right now. Get started at my website, preparewithshawn.com. There you'll save $200 on an essential three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Over the years, My Patriot Supply has helped millions of American families prepare for emergencies. Yours should be next. Sealed inside ultra-durable packaging, their delicious meals last up to 25 years in storage and provide over 2,000 calories daily. Eat right when things go wrong with these three-month emergency food kits from My Patriot Supply. With $200 in savings, you can get enough for each family member. They deserve your protection. Go to preparewithshawn.com. Order by 3 p.m. for free same-day shipping. Preparewithshawn.com. All right, Christian, we're back from the break. We had just kind of covered your first operational combat experience uh, with the Iraq invasion. And so before we move on in your career, is there anything else that you would like to discuss when it comes to the Pathfinder? 
uh, stuff. I, th- I think I'll just leave it at that. You want to leave it yeah, at that? Yeah, leave it at that. that they're the stories. Perfect. Well, <clears throat> let's move into the SAS. Mm-hmm. It took you three times to get in there. Yeah. When did you find out about the Special Air Service? Um, I knew, I, I found out quite young as a, as a, as a, when I was quite young. Okay. But when, as they still are today, they were within newspapers a lot. The Iranian embassy siege happened in 1980. I, I can't remember that. I, I was, I would have been four years old, but I, I, that, people say they remember it. I, I don't remember it. But, uh, but I'd always heard them being mentioned. And, and it's still to this day is what people say. It's the, it's the magic dust of the country. Oh, they should just send the SAN, SAS in to go and get them or to kill them or to do this or to... So that's what the, the working man is like, is like saying, oh, just send the SAS in. So they'll sort them out. So, um, and then the movie, as mentioned before, Who Dies Wins, I saw that when I was... I think it would have been 11 or 12 years old which is still, you could argue, too young to see that movie, but I saw it, and in my mind, I always, that's why I was like, I need to, I need to be in the SES. Hmm. When I joined the army, and when I was in training, and when I was in, I never mentioned about joining the SES. I never, I never openly said it to people. Well, I want to do one thing at a time. I wanted to get in the parachute regiment first. Let's get in the parachute regiment first, and then. So, But in my heart, even when I went into the army recruiting office, and I wanted to, you in my mind, I wanted to be in the SES. You know. What is the, can you can you explain a little bit of the difference between SAS and SBS? The, there's kind of no real difference. Really? Um, they do the same, well, there's no real difference. One is the, so, the, there's lots of different, people will say, oh, what's he saying that for? The selection process is identical, so we do a joint selection. Okay, so you're so mixed in. Yeah, so you do joint selection and and that, and and they're and they're the but the on paper they are the um, maritime um, tier one special forces element. Okay, so so there's um, not one up here and no. one they're equivalent. They're supposed to be the same. So. Roger that. So. Roger that. <clears throat> when it comes to the selection, are you recruited? For SBS, SAS? You volunteer to you do You volunteer. Yeah. Do you volunteer for... what? Are they? Do they both fall under an umbrella? You you, 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 you can if you're in the Army, uh, apply to join the SBS. And if you're in the Navy or the Royal Marines, you can apply to join the SAS. Or, so this or, or, or is, RAF as well. Uh, so this is basically Delta, Delta SEAL Team yes, 6 yeah. equivalents, yeah. If, correct? Mm-hmm. SBS would be more the Team 6, Delta would yes. be more the SAS. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And you volunteer, so you put a request in through your unit. That goes to the recruitment cell. And then you have to do some courses, pre-courses to get on selection. And then you go on selection, and it's a, it's a six-month process. On, and, then, and then continuation training after you're badged into your unit. But the continue, continuation training is then separated. So the, so the guys who pass the SES selection do their continuation. To do their continuation training in Hereford and the SBS in, in Poole. And like that's where they'll do their dive training and things. Okay. So. Do you guys do dive training? No. No? All air stuff? Uh, it's, a, it's just a mix. No, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. <clears throat> what is the, what is the, what are they looking, what do you think they're looking for when it comes to recruiting SAS guys? I think, um, we being blunt about it is the one people who are physically capable, whatever that means, so robust and fit, mm-hmm. like really fit and really robust people. But uh, more importantly, a selection continues is you need to be able to assimilate information and be time is always precious. In theory, the selection should be much longer but we're sort of cramming a lot of stuff in and trying to test and evaluate. So we want people who can pick up, assimilate emulation quickly, get get told something, put it into practice, and then do the next skill set. So the, and, and being able to work with, with other people of, uh, is another key requirement. So that's kind of what they're looking for. Is there a certain type of 
disposition, attitude, demeanor um, that they're looking for? Not what they're looking for. I think people just fall into that category. Okay. What is it like? Do they have interviews before you go to the selection? I'm not. They didn't when I was. You just yeah. throw your name in the hat, yeah. get approved, and you're in. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you do the course here. Yeah. Interesting. What is the? What would you say the culture is like? What is it like when you show up for selection? Are they welcoming? Do they treat you like shit? No, it's very quiet. It's just people. Again, we're on the borders of what I'm going to talk about and not talk about. But mm -hmm. um, when you turn up selection, it's similar to joining the army again. Everyone's measuring everyone up. Mm -hmm. The from the instructor point of view, they're not seeing anything. They're not imposing anything. They're not. They don't need to. Strictly evaluation. It's just they're not. They're not like screaming, shouting, doing whatever. They're just. They're, they're part of the, they don't, like I said, the selection process, they, they, every, people know what they're getting into, but it's more of the, you know, when 200 people or so, just short of 200 people turn up on day one and you're looking around going, statistically about, you know, six to, six to 12 people are going to graduate out of this. So you get about a 5% chance and, yeah, of making it. And sometimes it's bigger courses, sometimes it's smaller, but um, like pass, but you're looking around and you're thinking, who, who's going to pass? Am I going to be one of these? Is mm -hmm. there someone else? Are you weighing it up and just getting the measure of people, I suppose? And then, and then so it starts. The, that's roughly a 5% success rate. I believe so. That's what it should be. How many people came out with you? Well, we had a, had a quite a big course. So it must have been easy. So it's like, I think 18. 18 yeah. came out? Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> At what point do you figure out if you're going SAS or SBS? Beforehand. Before, yeah, so that, you that, know what you're trying out for yeah, beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. don't. They don't. They don't put you into a box and say you are actually a bit better in the SBS. And you, it's um, that's that's you put in for um, for service in the SS. They, that may have changed now. I'm not sure. I'm out of the loop somewhat. But, so um, what did, what happens if they have a class where everybody wants to go SAS? That's it. And, and nobody and wants to go SBS. There's been courses where just one person has passed. No like shit. Two, two people, I think, as well. And, you know, so it's like yeah. Interesting. Well, how do they fill billets? That could be a potential problem. Is I've I'm I'm kind of I'm I'm out of the loop now. So the the big problem is is we have a lot of people. I think people are leaving now because of the war on terror is finished. So mm -hmm. so there tends to be people leaving, and sometimes the more people are leaving than coming in. Is it? Man, is you know, it's really it's really interesting just to see. It's. We're going to go off on a tangent here, so get ready. But it's really interesting to me to watch special operations, the tip of the spear, globally just diminish and vanish into, I feel like it's going to vanish into nothing. You know, the the Canadian guys, have you ever worked with them, the Kansoff? Um, I've got some friends. Tier one in guys, I mean... Recruitment numbers way down, way completely demoralized the unit. I interviewed this guy, Dallas Alexander. I, I know Dallas, he's a friend of mine. No kidding? Yeah. You guys know each other? Yeah. Well, damn, I wanted to connect you, but so much yeah. for that. Yeah, we, um, um, yeah, we met up uh, recently at the, uh, we were supporting uh, Frontline Healing Foundation, and he was playing his stuff. And that's the first time we met. Oh, cool. And, uh, but we talked to each other before, and like, so it was like, but he's a uh, real great guy. I love that guy, man. He's, uh, Salt to like, the earth, like just. That's what I keep saying to him. Though, I goes, "Remember me when you're super famous. Remember <laughs> me. Remember me when you when you, because he is good. And this is not a shameless. What do you call it? like a plug for yeah. him? He is. I said you are, you are waiting to. Yeah, yeah this, this, yeah, yeah. He's 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 some of his tracks are like good, but their numbers are down. British Special Forces numbers are down. American Special Forces numbers are down. Nobody's signing up for this. I feel like the special operator is becoming obsolete. Do you do you feel like that? I feel like warfare is evolving and the special operator is 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 being phased out. I I would say I think it's more of the ebb and flow of society mm -hmm. and the military, you know, and some things are popular, some things aren't popular, mm -hmm. and it's just this. Um, and and I I don't I can't really speak on behalf of 
UK Special Forces because, like I say, I'm out the loop, so I don't know how their recruiting is and how their retention is. But I've heard it's not good, but that might be not might be wrong. But it's this ebb and flow of, like, right now, they're not they're not like ten years ago that they were the they were the 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 the, the pick of the litter. Mm-hmm. Now maybe like things are focusing elsewhere or who knows in, in and like I say it's just an ebb and flow and, and it's usually if something happens to then oh we need to make this a priority again yeah so I think it's a, it's a real shame to just watch all the experience disappear mm. you know because when the next one you know when the next war comes up that that experience all of that experience will be gone because yeah. they've demoralized the unit the units, plural. It, 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 I think uh, part of the problem with with this, it's not this is not focused to special forces, is when you have leadership who look to the, the the political side of things and try and please their political masters, and like instead of like the focus of supporting the army, they're just looking for the next gig probably, mm-hmm. and to be popular with the with their political masters and you know they to not so that's why everything's all this corporate knowledge is just lost yeah all these skill sets they don't care because it's like a black mark oh, i was in the i was served in iraq and afghanistan and people might say oh we don't talk about that we don't want to know what you did yeah we don't want to know that and, and rather than saying right what did you what did you actually learn what did what was some of the points so we know now we've got a whole generation potentially of instructors who haven't been in a you haven't done like fob life you know, mm-hmm. like from an art, this is from, speaking from a, a Green Army point of view. All these guys who served in FOBs and, and leaders and things, and now they've gone, and now there might be another generation who they didn't pass that on to because they need that information. Because they didn't, no one decided to capture it. It's it's not only do they not decide to capture it, they have they have ostracized the experience from some of the units. Dallas is a perfect example. I mean the. The man was on a what four man sniper team that has the longest sniper kill yeah. in the history of the world. And they ostracized him from the unit. They flushed that experience down the fucking toilet. There's there is an element, isn't there? We've covered this and it's not you the too. first time I've seen it is the um veterans that didn't matter what says don't like success. They don't like good things. Yeah. Someone you too. takes the longest sniper shot. I mean, with what, with what you were involved in in Nairobi and all the experience that we're that we don't even know about. I mean, they have. I mean, look at the experience you have to pass on to the future generations of SAS, and they fucking flush that down the toilet. It is. It's. It's. It's disgusting. You know. You. You. You could have imparted a lot more wisdom than you have on that unit, and I'm sure you would have been. So I have more to like to say I, I am on good terms with with my with with two two SAS. You are at this moment in time. Um, I'm on good good terms. I um, and I, I re, there's a whole load of reasons why I retired. I didn't retire bitter. I I did I did have some grievances with some leadership members. And I felt that either they, they were jealous of what I did or they were getting pressure from outside of the regiment. Um, but it was more of a timing thing. I did 28 years and, and, and things like that. So I, le- I left the SES extremely proud that I'd served in that unit. Mm-hmm. And I was on camp just uh, about three weeks ago talking with the command sergeant major. And um, so, so and, and like I said, hey, I'm friendly forces and... You know, they, and um, like I said to him, I'm not, I'm not bitter towards the regiment. I'm bitter towards the British government. I'm British towards the Ministry of Defence, and I'm British towards some personalities of leadership at, who were in command in 2019, 2020. That's that's my that's my issue, and it's all personal stuff. It's not, but but as a as a as a um, yeah, I, I've, I'm super proud of the SS, and I would always support them if I could. Mm-hmm. Um, it, but but there, to your point is, it's not just me. There's lots of men with lots of experience, and once you're out, they don't care. Mm-hmm. They're not saying they're not calling people back or saying what do you think about this. They're not saying. Well, what? I mean, I get messages from operators 
saying, hey, I'm looking at this weapon scope. What do you think on it? What do, we're th- looking about doing this sort of drill for hostage rescue. What do you think? And I'm like, all right, Caleb. Well, well you know, they and, did. And, and that's what comes back to you on this, on the of, of support. Um, maybe we'll touch on it later, but that's one thing I'm extremely grateful for is that I've had nothing but support from members of members and peers of the SAS, not just the guys I served with, but the older generation have all supported me. And now the future generation, they're coming up to me when they see me in Hereford and say, you don't know who I am, but I'm actually, I'm in whatever squadron you inspired me to join the, join the, join the SAS. Thanks. And the guys all send the regards and stuff. And it's not just about what I did that day. They're actually talking about social media, um, the potential book, which probably isn't going to come out, but the, the book that's been written, um, the, the, say this is a story that needs to be told, and we'll we'll touch on that in a, in a bit anyway. But it's good to get you know it's good to get support from your peers. Yeah, and let's talk about the culture within that unit. Let's talk about the the just the culture, what daily life is like as an SAS operator. So what do I mean by the culture? I mean how are you received when you make it through selection and you get to you? I think. Your um, unit? Again, I'm, I kind of don't want to really talk much about this. It's everyone's just driven, and they're working towards whatever the mission at hand is. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say on that. All Every right. squadron's different. Every team's different. The best way to round it all off is everyone in that right, nearly everyone, the driven professionals working towards whatever mission is their focus. That's 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 what it is across the board. Okay. Well. We will scoot past SAS into 15 January 2019, Nairobi, Kenya. Five terrorists from Al-Shabaab, Somalia. It was a 19-hour gunfight standoff, evacuated approximately 700 civilians. There were 21 casualties, 28 wounded, 19 Kenyans, one American, one British. <clears throat> was at the Dusset D2 Luxury Hotel in 14 Riverside Plaza in Nairobi's affluent Westgate neighborhood. Let's talk about that day. So how did that day start? So that that day, um, just before we go into it and people set up, um, the incident itself, people know about it. Am I going to talk about that incident? Not really. I'm going to talk around it and I'm going to mention it, but I'm not going to talk about what I did and what happened that day, just so we're clear, just so people are aware of this. But it's a remarkable day and a remarkable story. And it starts, the day started in an unusual way. So I I did my own little bit of training that that morning just by myself. I was training out in, in in a rural area and didn't finish my day's training or my morning's training. It was an early start. And I'm driving back to the city. I'm driving down the road. And as I pull onto what I would call the main, but it's just a dirt track leading into the city, I pull on. And on this dirt track, you sometimes see a Maasai tribesman walking down it. You sometimes see workmen uh, who are working on the Chinese rail circuit in, in, in Kenya. But you don't really see many people on this dirt track because to walk from where I pulled onto the road to the nearest village would probably take you a good three hours plus. And it's a um, dirt track. So I pull onto this, tr- as I pull onto this track, I'm kind of taken off guard because I see this guy walking down the road and he's dressed a short black guy, rounded black guy, um, wearing a business suit, immaculate business suit and highly polished shoes. And then something, I do something strange. I do something that I shouldn't have done. Just common sense, nothing to do with drills, procedures. I stop, the, stop my vehicle, put the window down and say, hey, do, hey buddy, do you want to lift? Something compelled me to pick him up to say, do you want to lift? And I, why, why I did that, you know, I, I would not have normally done that. And, but something compelled me to do that. So a big smile and he runs over and gets into the car. Uh, start driving off and he's like, oh, what's your, thank you so much for this. What's your name? 
I'm like, it's Chris. And he's like, tells me his name. And then he looks and says, how old are you? So I'm like, I'm like 43. He goes, I'm 43. So when were you born? I said, September. So like, I was born in September. What day were you born? And I said, 15th. He's like, I don't know what day I was born, but this is a good sign because that means in September 1975, Chris and his name were both born. And he chuckles. He's like, he says some of this stuff I can't really recall. Driving a bit further, and he reaches into his pocket. My internal spider sense is not trigger, triggered here. I don't feel threatened, anything. I don't feel. And he pulls out this big, like, dagger. And it's an odd dagger. And what was I found was odd was curved, but the, it had a double tip. So I had two tips at the end, which I'd never seen. And, he, and, he, and, I, and I just smile and say, you're not going to try and kill me with that, are you? And he's like, no, no, I'm not going to kill you. This is, a, I carry this when I'm traveling on this road in case I come across any demons or evil spirits. It comes in very handy. And he chuckles to himself and puts it away. So then moving on, and I turn, I, as I, I turn to him, judging how you're dressed, I take it you're going into the city. And he's like, no, 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 no. Please just drop me off at the first village we come to. And I said, oh, we're approaching one now. And it, it's an African village, so it's, it's an African village. Like, and... Um, and I went, this village? He's like, yes, yes, but don't don't take me into the village. Drop me just off outside. So, okay. So um, as we come to a stop, he opens the door. And then as his foot hits the ground, something happens. His foot hits the ground and his face changes. When I say changes, it's still the same man. But it's a bit like if I was, do you know when someone offends you and you pull their face like, oh, like you, you, if I'm going from smiling, you'd be like all serious. Like what? His face changed. And then he says, Chris. And when he says, Chris, I felt it in my heart. It like, it, it, it wasn't loud, but it was loud. It was stern. It was, it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't like he didn't shout Chris, but it was, he could have. Like, and it's hard to explain. It wasn't loud, but it was loud. It wasn't loud, but it was deafening. It was like, Chris, may God bless you many times this day. And then like that, his face just snapped out of it. And he's like, thank you, thank you, thanks, thanks, thanks. Back in his normal voice, normal face. And he closed the door and I drove off. And I got about 150 yards down the road. I couldn't see him again. I think he might have just gone into a into a, a, a house or a hut or whatever. And I, I kind of thought that was that was odd. But 30 hours later, after the most remarkable day of my life, I came to think about it a lot more. What happened? Well, then, a few hours later, uh, five terrorists attacked the Ducet D2 hotel complex. Five hours there, so on. But everything, the strange thing, not the strange thing, but traditionally I'm, I would see myself as unlucky. And if someone had said, this is going to happen on your watch, I'd normally say, well, I'm probably going to be on leave somewhere else, not available, don't hear about it. But from the moment I dropped that man off and he said, may God bless you many times this day, everything was perfect. I got my hair cut. I went and got my hair cut after that. Had a haircut. I then had lunch. I then got home, had a shower. And again, I'm not going to go into detail of the incident, but every second counted. And if anything then was off, everything was just perfect. And then the whole, and then not only perfect, but the whole, everything else was just like, yeah. What were you doing when the incident kicked off? I, I just got out of the shower. How did you hear about it? A friend of mine who was in the complex called me and was like, Chris, there's a complex attack going on. I'm not armed. I'm laying low in my office. You got to come down here. I said, I'm on my way. I didn't know where it was. Um, I'd never been there before. Put it in my sat nav and went and responded. Now, from what I understand, you were told to stand down no. and not enter. No. That's not true. No. I, uh, I didn't, no, no. I just, the difference is I, did, I had no authority. So no one had told me to go. And no one told me not to go. Did you feel compelled to go? Yeah, yeah. 
Did anybody go with you? Not initially. But that's, uh, again, we're going into this gray area now of what I can say, can't say, but the bottom line is I turned up with a view to doing something else and people were being murdered and I heard it. I heard a woman, I had gunfire grenades going off. I asked, and I assumed that was people dealing with the terrorists. And I was like, hey, special forces in there, police in there, and the security guard, no one's there, no one's here yet, no one's in there. Around about that same time, I heard a woman, I heard a woman scream, and then I heard gunfire, and that cut the scream off. And I realized that woman had just been murdered, or someone just been shot. And I was like, right, I'm going in. And then the rest is history, and not, not, not really up for discussion at this point. Can I ask you yes or no questions? You can ask me and I'll just maybe say, if I can't comment, I won't comment. I'll say no comment. Did you engage anybody when you entered the building? I... Did you personally save anybody from that building? I think it's video evidence of someone who looks like me doing stuff like that. How many people? Did that individual that looks like you save? Um, allegedly, people say 700. Um, that's 700 the, That's people. what people have said, that I'm responsible for saving that day. And I, and I don't think I'm going into any any like legal area here, but I'm, I mean, maybe from the from the view of the MOD, they might be like snort sharpening their knives right now for what I've said and not said. But, um, you know, I, I, I went in alone. But then it became a team effort with with some remarkable individuals. Kenyans? Yes. Yeah, so. How uncomfortable are you right now? Pretty uncomfortable. So Is there anything you want me to ask you? No, I mean we can just talk about again, I think the whole incident. People can see, and the only thing that I can add to the incident is like things that I did inside there and things that happened. And I can, and, and people have got good imagination, so you can imagine what happened inside there. So I don't need to, I don't need to upset people and, and break any kind of rules. But um, yeah, I, that incident happened, and then I, and then I finished the next day, and I and I was there throughout. Um, and I, I'm just not going to say about what I what I did exactly. People can probably work it out. Um, but it was the most remarkable day of my life, and I've done I've done close to a thousand door kicking missions, and um, there's nothing was ever like that day, nothing. And we talk, people talk about flow state, and whether it be training, I still do CQB today, and you still enter that flow state when you cross a threshold, whatever that be, whether it be skydiving, whether it be a CQB, whether it be some sort of sporting event. There's, you know, when you get dialed in and you, you like, like it's on. That day is, I unlocked some sort of superpower on that day. When I crossed that threshold or whatever that point was, it felt like I could see further. I could hear things. I could move faster. I was stronger. My mental agility. I really unlocked this like flow state, which was like. I'd have similar incidents before my military career, but on that day, if you could bottle that, I'm, I keep meaning to talk to Red Bull. I, I'm in contact with with Red Bull about floor state and and things. Oh, that's why I, my uh, I haven't really talked much of, to them about. I just made the con, uh, made the introduction. But if you could bottle that, or you could tap into that at will, then that's something to. That would change as a warrior. You could do remarkable things, or sports, or an athlete, or whatever. But when that, I thought I tapped into a true flow state before that. But once that day it was like, yeah, that's what it's like to be on on fire, to be when they say dialed in. Yeah, I was I was working hard. <clears throat> what ended it? What ended the incident? When did you know it was finished? 
um, I suppose when all threats neutralized. So. How long did that take? Um, that was uh, the whole uh, incident ended the following morning. It was about 18 hours? Uh, yeah, I think from suicide detonation to building clean and secure was about 18 hours. And then, and then I went home for a cup of tea. Well, I didn't go home actually, but I did some bits and pieces and then eventually I went home for a cup of tea. What what did you do after after the dust had settled, after the last threat was neutralized? I can't really talk about well, you know, again that's still that's still in the theory of of what happened that day. Again, I, I don't know how What was your emotional I was algorithm? Buzzing. Uh I, I then I went, I did, there's something happened afterwards and like I'm not gonna talk about and things happen and then I go back home. So I get home in the afternoon. And, um, Let's just talk about your emotions. I'm yeah. not asking about actions on objective. Right. On objective. Yeah. No, I'm just I'm asking I, about what's going on up yeah, here. Yeah. I'm like, how are you processing what yeah, just happened? I'm still like zero laser, like laser focused, sort of on high. And a, a friend of mine, the Padre, came out to um, see me a few days later, and he said you could feel it. You could feel it around you. You could feel this buzz off you still, days after the event. And you were like, yeah. You could feel this energy coming off you. And, and I didn't sleep well. For days afterwards, I was still, bodies just processing, still f running on adrenaline. Um, and then the, the, the thing we're feeling is like dialed in. And then um, when I, I went home, went went to the house and my house and had a shower, put a kikoi on, which is like a sar sar sarong. When you say home, are you talking UK or are you talking? Talking Kenya, okay. where I was living. And uh, make a cup of tea, turn on the TV. I'm on the Sky News. Put on, I put a, at the my I, iTunes on shuffle. In excess starts playing a song that I had. I, I'm a big fan of In excess, but never heard this song. It's called Searching, and like lyrics is I am searching. I am not alone, and stuff like that. And I'm just like, come, that's when it hits me. That's when that's when I'm like my eyes well up, and I'm like, "What just happened? What just happened?" Like it hadn't really sunk in, mm -hmm. and then for a few days after, I kept on bursting into tears, like bursting out crying. And it wasn't anything wasn't trigger. It wasn't things that were triggering me. I didn't. F and I asked the doctor about this. I said, "Doctor, I'm like, I keep on bursting into tears." I said, but the strange thing is, I'm not being triggered. I'm not like hearing something and or seeing something and it's triggering me. I feel fine. I feel absolutely fine. And then all of a sudden, without being able to control, I'm like, like start crying. I said, what what the hell's going on? Because I, I feel fine. And he's like, it's an, he, this doctor was like, it's an adrenaline dump. He goes, you just got, you just pumped all this adrenaline. He'd been through a traumatic experience. And this is like, the, this is like a release thing. And that was a strange thing. It was like I say, it wasn't triggered. I didn't hear a sad song or I didn't see something. It was just like driving along and all of a sudden, like, like what's this come from? It's like, mm -hmm. like a kind of diarrhea for crying. It was just like, oh no, I can't stop it. And then I just like start crying. And, I went, and eventually it stopped. That was a interesting thing that I'd never experienced before. What was the thought process going through your head when you had noticed that you were on all of the news channels and that somebody had captured you entering that building. Yeah, and it didn't really sink in very well. It didn't, it was just like, in some ways it still hasn't. You're in a trance. Yeah, and like in some ways I still still feel that way. That did, did it really happen? I don't know. Yeah, well, it did obviously, but I do, do know. But. Do you keep in touch with anybody that was in that building? Yes. Yeah. Who was that? Uh, Millie. So the American, um, American lady, who is in a in, in a room there. Um, she wrote the book "Terrorist Attack Girl," so. and uh, I keep in touch with some other people connected to the incident. And What's it like to hear from the woman that wrote that book? I mean, um, yeah, it's it, I'm, I, I love I love Melee a bit. She's like. Um, and her book is amazing, Terrorist Attack Girl. Again, not a shameless um, drop or whatever you call it, plug. Her book is really good. She she suffered immensely after that incident of PTSD. 
and she's one of the most remarkable human beings I've ever met. Super intelligent, super motivated, super like brilliant. And she dealt with her PTSD, but not only dealt with it, then said, how do I help other people with PTSD? And how does, and um, she's, the, her book's really interesting, really well well written, it's a fascinating read. Do you guys discuss the incident mm -hmm. often together? Not often, but when I first met her, I met her in uh, DC in um, end of 2019. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we just discuss things. And, and for her, it was to put like, cause she heard things that were going on. And, and I said, that's because that, at that point I would have been doing this. And she went, that explains what that noise was and all this was happening. And, she was hiding in a room. Mm -hmm. She had no idea what was going on, but she's hearing all these noises and things going on. So I helped her. She'd already dealt um, really well with her PTSD, but I like helped put, fill in some gaps and, and bits and pieces of what what ha what was happening that day that she hadn't been told or, or she didn't know. How did it feel when you saw her for the first time? Yeah, it was, it was emotional. It was emotional. Yeah. Was it for her as well? Yeah. Yes. What were some of the first things that were said? I, I don't know. I think she just said thank you. I can't uh, not remember, but, but we were talked about. Yeah, but I can't read. Really I can't tell the story of how I met her husband. That is a remarkable story. I can't tell it, but it's it's strange how everything surrounding this incident is odd. But I, it was a strange way of how I met her husband. So yeah, it's. Uh... It's hard to dance around this topic. There's so much that you can't talk about. So. But <clears throat> what point did you recall the man that you picked up on the road that day? When did that connection get made? He said, what did he say? Oh, oh yeah. God may bless go you. Um, You're going to need it today. Is that Chris, may God bless you many times this day. When did that come back into your head? Were you in the building, or was this days later? It was always the, it was it was that that mo the morning after it, that it, it, yeah it came to me. It came to me before I left the, the the complex. How did that feel? Again, it's this again a, a compared in. I've got all this emotion going on, all this like buzz. So it was like lost in all that. Mm -hmm. But but when you did feel it, yeah, or when it did come back into your head. Yeah. What was that about? Like, like? Again, another one of those. Did that really happen? Did that? How did that happen? That's just my. You know, I don't like. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna spoon feed you all, and say. Sometimes I think, was he an angel? Maybe. Maybe not. Was he delivering a message from God? Yes. Yes, he was. And he, there's, there, that's all I've got to say is, it's not all I've got to say, I've got a lot to say about it, but it's like maybe sometimes God's angels, like God or angels, um, use people. You know, sometimes someone might say something to you and they're like, might be a stranger, might be someone you love, and you're like, you know, it's like a message, mm -hmm. and that was a message. That was a message. That that was a message. That moment, you know, whether that guy is a real person, fine. But like I say, his, his face changed. His voice, like I say, it was quiet but deafening. That he was delivering a message from God or from an angel, saying, "May God bless you many times this day." Man, that's incredible. That is really incredible. And to hear. some people out there are going to say, "Oh, it's just a." Strange, a uh, coincidental meeting between two strangers. Who gives a shit what yeah. people say? But it's that. But that. That's my. That's my theory. It could have been an angel manifested as a human. What do you think it was? I. I think it's a a human delivering him like a message. Like he didn't. Did he know he said it? Maybe. Maybe not. It's just. But it, the whole thing was just using it as a. You know, like a moment of possession. Or do you think he was an angel or not? No, I think that's the thing. Is I think if, as a, he's, I think he was a physical human being, but he was delivering a message from an angel. Okay. Then, as in, he was like, what do you call it? What if you want to call it possession, or if you want? But he was at that moment, 
that wasn't him speaking. Do you feel you were alone in that building? No. Did you feel it when it was happening? Sorry? Did you feel like somebody was with you, like Abs God was absolutely. with you in that yep. building as yep. it was happening? Yeah. Man. But again, without talking about the incident in general, one of the, like I've said this at the start of this interview is that I'm super like privileged or blessed that the incident kind of happened in a, in a purely selfish way that people live their whole lives without, not without me, like not meaning, but they, the do good things, not good things, whatever, and then they die. And we're always trying to make sense of stuff and meaning. And that was the thing for me up, up to that point in life, and my life isn't over yet, but that made sense of everything that had bad that had happened to me, whether it be career moments where I thought I should have done better in my career and was, thought I was it was unjust or something happened or I didn't get sent somewhere, or I didn't do something, I didn't pick for a certain team or whatever. All that made sense. All of it was like, thank you. And every night I pray, I pray about, I thank, thank God for all the bad things that happened to me, for all the things that at the time I thought were unjust or unfair. Because now I realized, now I realized that they had to happen to put me there that day. Yeah. And... And I asked to see the like the signs now of like you know when things are going really bad. It's like it's very hard to do. And again, it's it's like and everyone knows you know, when people say things happen for a reason. It's really a patronizing thing to say, but they kind of do happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I, I give a presentation to um, the officer academy Sandhurst. I did a, a large brief, but first first hand the first time I did a, the presentation about Kenya, I did um, I briefed the uh, like they've got a platoon which all the wounded. Uh, students go to and they do rehab and then once they're fixed they go back into training and uh, and I give them a present I give them the presentation at the end of it I, onto this line about you know everything that happened that was bad happened to me to put me there and I said right now you guys in this room are kind of like don't feel good because you're looking out the window and you're injured and you see guys who you were girls and guys who you were in training with are now graduating and you're still stuck here and they're going to be officers in the army I said but just remember this right now in this audience there may be the chief of general staff the head of the armed forces that could be the commander of the SES that could be the director of special forces sat in this audience right now and the only reason why that's going to happen is because you were injured now so remember that in the future when you're the head of the army and that sort of hit home some yeah. of them. yeah where did you go after the incident? After you left Kenya, um, where did you go? Uh, did you go back to UK. Back to UK eventually. And How were you received? Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Like, and it still is today. The my peers, uh, everyone was like, "It what?" And this is the odd thing, you know. People, if you don't know, in the military, normally, even if you do something good. Even j jokingly, they'll like give you a bad time. They'll be, oh, I can't mm -hmm. believe you're wearing Armani jeans or you were doing this. And that. No, this was strange. This was like everyone was like, even people who I respect for this guy saying, I didn't see eye to eye with you in the past. You know, I don't want to see my friends, but I'm proud to know you. And that was to me was like, yeah, that that took that took balls to say that the guy who said that was a good guy I was on selection with. I respect that. Say, yeah, I wasn't your friend. I didn't really like you, but I'm proud. That, I'm proud that I know you. And people sit still to the stage, stopping cars, getting out, going, shaking my hand. And, and and the oddest thing was the it was the old the old guard guys who were in the SES in the eighties before the eighties and nineties. And I thought they'd be critical. And not only they're positive about uh, you're a great ambassador for the SES. What you did is def is is like is the epitome of what the SES is supposed to be about. They're saying that, and I'm like, and then and then, all the, and then they're writing in about social media. Yeah, my, my daughter, my son follows you on social media, and it's great what you do. We're really proud of you. Just keep doing it. Keep being a good ambassador for the regiment. 
So that's always good. And the, and the thing with the book, the book one man in, I wrote it. They originally told me I could write a book. Then I changed. I tried to clear it. I It didn't get released. I took it to court, lost that. I'm trying to appeal that. The bottom line is it's highly unlikely that anyone's going to read one man in anytime soon. But even if I lose the appeal, people change, policies change, positions change. It, people don't realize what's it. happening. So we have to go into that. They don't realize that it's in court. Yeah, it's, it's been a court and failed. And uh, so I wrote a book called One Man In. I, I, I did ask before I retired, could I write a book about the incident? And they said, yes, work with disclosure. I worked with disclosure. And then there was a change of mind somewhere along the line. And then they said I couldn't. I then tried to make redactions. They weren't interested whatsoever. And then, so I took it for a judicial review, lost the judicial review. And now I'm appealing the judicial review. It's highly unlikely that I'm going to win any appeal. Why do you think they're trying to suppress the story? I can't. I, I, it's, it, there's, a, there's a public here, like ruling out there that you can read it. It's the What I'll say about the incident is I've just said about my peers and members of the SES and public got nothing but support for me. But the, in my opinion, there's a lot of people, the establishment did not like what I did that day. They did not like what I did. And it's maybe, is it personal towards Chris Craighead? Maybe, maybe not. But it's definitely personal to what Chris Craighead represents, which is one man, not not showing no compromise, standing up to e evil, taking on evil head on without permission and putting everything on the line. And that's the nature of special forces operations, I thought, was high, it's a high stakes game. I didn't just risk my life because if that had been a failure, I would have been the scapegoat. So I risked my, 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 my physical life and my life in general. I risked everything. And I didn't want anything for it. I just, people were, people were, people were, people being, were being murdered and no one was doing anything. So I did something. And people don't like that. And here's the thing. So, from a good example is a senior member of the British military, I've had said, Christian Craighead is a bad example to young soldiers because his mutineer attitude promotes lawlessness in the military. And clearly that's a, um, someone said, I heard that from five different people, five independent sources, who, and I'm not going to pinpoint the exact person who said that because the five people who told me, they said three people said one person and uh, two people said another. So, but they're a similar job. So it was just a mix up of abbreviations. But, but yeah, senior member of the British military, that's what, that's the, his view. It's been, I've also heard of people in the foreign office saying, oh, Chris Craighead, he shouldn't have done that thing in Kenya. There's lots of people in the foreign office who completely, really support me, support me, uh, big, in a big way. But there's also members, senior members of the foreign office, and he shouldn't have done that. He could have, he could have messed everything up. How's that? How could you have messed? Yeah, everything because if up? I'd failed, it would have been potentially they could have said, "Well, it's all failed because of that man." So I would have been the scapegoat, and it would have looked bad for everyone else. But that's it. And these people, like these generals and these um, politicians and these other people who have never said, and no one, no one's took me and said thanks for what you did. Not not one British high-ranking official. Not one uh, British and high-ranking um, official. I got Thank a nice letter from the government official straight after the incident and a phone call. But he got his fingers wrapped for that. He's no longer a minister, or he is a minister, but he's not in parliament. Or whatever that is. You a, saved 700 people that it, day and, and they're treating you like you need to be punished. And it was the, um, and I, what I want to say to people is the last time I fucking checked, the motto of 2 2, two SES is who dares wins, not who asked for permission wins. People need to remember that. But um, yeah. Um, but then, President Trump, 
I got to I had the extra <laughs> privilege to meet the president of the United States of America. You got to meet. This is after the incident. Yeah. How long after? Uh, um, uh, ten months after. Ten months. Yeah. Why were you here? So, um, so before we go into the meeting, the the president of the United States of America. There's a reason why I said the president of the United States of America is to everyone watching this. Can we just leave these like the personal like? This was President Trump. It doesn't matter that it was President Trump. He was the president of the United States of America. I was a a a guy, a young boy who was dealt a hand in life, destined to fail, born in a council house, single parent at that time, in a poor area with no particularly good skill set. Yet, forty three years later, I'm I'm in the White House. This is a good story. It's it's not a it's not a political message. It's it's my life story. It's it's a story of my life of me meeting the president. So now we're going to continue, um, just um, just for anyone who's going to get triggered. Um, so yeah, I'm, I was going to um, I was in the United States to brief to brief a military unit about what I did in Africa in Kenya, and uh, a friend of mine, a friend of a friend, was like speaking to the Secret Service. The Secret Service was super keen to talk to me because they wanted to know about hotels and lessons that I learned and things that they could use. And so they said, could you, when you're on your way to um, to do this presentation, could you come and just give us a, some of our team leaders and some of our senior members want to talk to you and ask you some questions about the incident? And I said, yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, and then about not long, about a week or two before I'm supposed to go there, I get a phone call from the guy who's hosting me. And he said, have you ever been to the White House? I'm like, no. He goes, well, bring a suit. Because when you once you do your, once you talk to our guys, we'd love to take you to the White House and give you a tour of the White House and show you around. I'm like, oh, it's really nice. Look forward to it. That's that. So the day comes, I'm speaking to the Secret Service, and then we get changed. Meanwhile, in the White House, in the West Wing, Sheila Craighead is the director of photography. And she's got a... She's she's on the she's got she's got a finger on the pole. She's connected to everyone, and she's move, she's the mover. And she's one of the movers and shakers in the West Wing, and she knows she knows my story. I didn't know Sheila Craighead at that time, but she's been told by the Secret Service this guy's coming, and da da da. So they, she then speaks to uh, the Vice President's team and said, "Just so it's on your radar, there's this guy who can remember that guy who did this thing." And they're like, "Yeah." Well, he's coming to the White House today, just so you know. And they went, okay. And then, and she, and, and she speaks to the National Security Advisors people as well, just say, just so you know. And they go, all oh, right, that's good. They then speak to their respective bosses, and as we're en route into the White House, the Secret Service get a phone call and they say, oh, the the Vice President, uh, Mike Pence wants to chat with Chris Craighead, and they're like, all right, you've got to go and see the the Vice President. So I'm like, okay. I haven't got my phone, so I can't ask for permission. Not that I would anyway, but um, so I then go and meet Mike Pence, see him, have a quick chat, and then carry on with the tour of the White House. Um, Mike Pence, I believe, men mentioned to the National Security Advisor, Ambassador Robert O'Brien, and says, "Hey, that guy, Chris Craighead, or, um, is in, in is in the White House." And uh, the NSA is like, I, I want to, I need definitely want to speak to him. So the Secret Service got a phone call again. You have got to bring him back into the West Wing. Ambassador O'Brien wants to speak to him. So then they send me into Ambassador O'Brien. What a great guy. Super um, bright. But the good thing, the great thing about Ambassador Robert O'Brien is not only is he bright, but he's super pleasant as well. So he's. Again, laser. I keep on saying laser focused, laser focused. You loads as a national security advisor should do. You was talking to me about situations going on. What do you think about this? What was your What was your issue? We here, there, then. So I had a really good chat with him for about I think it's about forty five minutes, which is um, some going for a man of who I am to speak to someone like that in the White House and the busy people. And then he's like he's talking, and he's like, "Have you uh, Have you spoke to Portis yet?" And I'm like, so that's the president of the United States. 
And I'm like, no, he goes, well, I know he wants to chat to you. All right, let's go. And I'm like, it's a whirlwind. It's This is like a whirlwind. So he stands up, come on, let's go. Out through the secret service, like, oh, Chris, this way. And he's like, no, and Basil Bryan, no, 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 we're, we're, we're just going to see uh, Portis. And they're like, all right, this is this is getting big. So, so then we, we move through um, past the receptionist. And then they say, just wait in here. So I'm in this room and they say, just wait here. And they go into another door and I can hear voices inside. So inside now the, there would be, um, there's, the, basically that room is the, the president's private study. And I'm in this room just kicking my heels by myself. And as I said to you last night, I think it's, I've got this, the dubious honor of being the only person who's been in the Oval Office who didn't know he was in the Oval Office. So, <laughs> so I'm in the Oval Office and don't realize I'm in the Oval Office by myself. Um, he, the door opens, I hear some talking and stuff. And then, uh, uh, and in there is, uh, and then I walk in and I'm met by President Trump. And, uh, and he um, looks at me, walks over, puts his hand out. And the first thing he says to me is, thank you for saving American lives. Is that the first person that thanked you from a high ranking government position? Uh, yes. Well, n no. In person, yes. Immediately after the incident, um, there was a, the, a government minister from UK sent me, uh, f phoned me up and sent me a letter. That was, that was it. Nobody from your own country no, personally came people, up to people you. People from the army. To thank from, you for what you did. People from the army, people from um, like members of the military, members of um, any, any of the diplomats in Kenya did, but no one outside that and no one, still, no one ever has since either. Wow. And, um, but President Trump, um, he was, thank you for saving American lives, which if you don't, you can, we all, and we chatted about a lot of other stuff, but if you think, you know, if you just park all your opinion or whatever, think about that. I, I went into that private study. There was no media there. There was, the British government didn't know about it. So in theory, there's absolutely no gain whatsoever for the president. No gain at all. Mm -hmm. But he took time out to thank me for saving Americans. Something to think about. Something to acknowledge, mm -hmm. I'd say. Um, yeah, and then, and then, and then we, we left, and then I got shown the, around the Oval Office by Ambassador um, O'Brien and things. And, and then... And then, uh, and then that was that was that that was that. It was a like a strange, strange days. I say there um, wasn't very well received from the Brit to the British government. They found out about it. Yeah, I, 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 I um, so I give uh, President Trump a, a, a coin, a challenge coin, and I got a Trump uh, a president's coin. So I was calling the guys up saying, hey, I just so you, I bet, I can't, you can't believe this. I met the president yesterday and gave him a coin. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. And then some, some, someone, someone said, have you told the commanding officer? And I went, no. They went, probably should do. And then, uh, and that's what I thought. And I told them, basically, long story short, I told them and all hell broke loose. Um, the big thing, I'm not giving them a free pass, but from a foreign office point of view, it's like a huge breach of protocol. My argument is, I didn't have any saying it, and I'm certainly not going to say, "Hey, the president wants to see you," and you go, "No, nah, I've got to ask permission first. There's a bit of a pattern forming here, but um, but yeah, I didn't. I'm not going to say. So I was like, I have to go with the flow, but apparently they're still not happy about it today, and you know, I'm sure there'll be some backlash from what I'm saying this now. I mean, so I don't know so how. the who who was upset? The the foreign office and then. And I think the I think it's the whole. The big, foreign office is upset that the president of the United States yeah, thanked it's, you. It's because I broke. It's it's like the break the breach of protocol. It's like what we said. People don't like successful things. Certain officers of the time of that command in my unit didn't like it. Maybe because they got shit from the foreign office. Who knows? Uh, they're not there anymore. But um, yeah, so that was that was it. And then, <laughs> um, what, what, I mean, hold yeah. on. 
What's that conversation like? Yeah. Hey, you just saved 700 people in Kenya from being murdered. And the president of the United States just said, thank you for saving American lives. How do you turn that into a negative? Yeah. But apparently, just so you know, this, is that what they is, think this, about? This, this do they the think that way about all this was, Americans? This was the statement I make, and if anyone's watching, like, f like, I'm not going to obviously say who said it, but this was said to me over the phone when I was in America. Was you've undermined the um, the SAS, the army, uh, the government, and the country. So I can't even imagine the amount of rage that but, um, yeah. festered. But I'm going to reiterate something. I have got no issue with my old unit, the SES. I'm super proud to be there. But I have got issues with elements of the government, the MOD, and previous and some ex command members of the uh, of the unit. Um, but that's and then it, but it gets it gets better or worse and then it, this is this so this this story will evolve into a few about a month later is I'm back in London so I'm back in back in London I'm still living in Hereford and uh, it's Christmas Christmas time and um, this was kind of I think the final straw for where where Chris Craighead sits in the British Army but. Um, uh, and like I say, I'm not bitter or anything. It's just, it's just, a, it, this is a good story. Um, so I'm in London. I get a phone call, withheld number. I think it's work. I'm like, hello. Yeah, this is the special assistant to the um, U.S. ambassador, ambassador to um, UK. Um, can, he's on the line waiting to talk to you. Can you take a call? I'm like, yeah. So I answer the call. And he's like, hey, hey, Chris, this is Woody Johnson. Um, I've just been speaking to Portis about you. He says you're, you're a good stand-up guy. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to meet you for coffee. Or you, I know you're in London, so do you want to come and, um, do you want to come round for a coffee? Like now, I'll hold all my meetings. I'm like, yes, yes, Mr. Ambassador, I'm, I'm on my way. So I was like, okay. So I then went back to the shop I just walked out of and put my shopping behind and said, you, don't, you couldn't do me a favor, I couldn't leave these here, I've got to do something. So I'm like, yeah. So get in a taxi. Felt like being in a movie. I'll get in a taxi, take me to the US Embassy. And, it's like, <laughs> and then we go to, so we go to the, uh, drive to the Embassy, people are waiting for me, straight up to the ambassador office. And then there's Ambassador um, Woody Johnson. He's like, hey, great to meet you. And uh, so we then have a chat, have a cup of coffee, um, great guy, really interesting things to say, asking me questions. It was, it was fun. I'm then about to leave and he says, hey, uh, I've got something to ask you. I'm like, okay. He goes, I'm, I'm having drinks around my house tonight. I would love you for you to come round. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Mr. Ambassador, I'm just in town doing some shopping. This I'm wearing, um, <laughs> I'm wearing jeans, um, a turtleneck sweater, and a pico, <laughs> so I so I look like an assassin. <laughs> so I look like, oh, and uh, and uh, I look like, and I'm like, I'm, this is the only clothes I've got. And he goes, no, it's my part. You just come. People will just be wearing um, suits anyway. So just come round. And it's my part. I'm like, well, I goes, I when I saw when I, I said to be honest, Mr. Ambassador, when I saw President Trump, I got in a lot of hot water for this. So it's kind of going to happen again if I do it. He went. Sort it out. Whatever you need my assistant to do, we'll make we'll make it happen. And um, uh, so I'm like, okay. It then says, "Oh, there's one more thing." I'm like, I'd love for you to. Um, usually, I, I as the U.S. representative, I say something to all my to all the all the people here. I'd love for you to say something on behalf <laughs> of Great Britain. And I'm like. Oh, like, so can you can you put together with my assistant a three to five minute presentation on what you did, why you did it, and what the special relationship means to you? I'm like, okay. So it's like, um, so then I phone work, speak to whoever, and they're like, yeah, you got to speak to the commander. Commander's like, yep. Yeah. He actually says, yeah, who does wins? Go do it. Fine. So then... Um, 
speak to them. It's all set. So I'm now feel a bit better that at least my unit know this time. Um, and then, um, so then I go and get my shopping. This is about 4.30 in the afternoon, by the way. And this event is happening at 6.30. So in my mind, I'm putting together this presentation. I'm just like... So I then go go to the sh at Ballstaff, get my uh, gear, turn up at the ambassador's residence with my shopping, and they let me in. And then basically, then they saying when they all the guests are turning up, the uh, I'm stood next to the ambassador and his and his beautiful wife, dressed like an. They must have thought I'm some CIA hitman or something. He's like he's CIA muscle or something. Um, but and then there was lots of like powerful people, including. Um, government ministers and 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 such are obviously uh, not obviously nothing's obvious, but I won't say any names or mm -hmm. who was there. But it was when I looked at the guest list, I was like, ah, okay, yeah, feeling pretty uncomfortable now. Um, so there was the it was the yeah, the high society, and uh, so then they're they're all there mingling. There's about I'm sure it's about 150 200 people. He's got and uh, they said. The, the ambassador is going to give his bit. You then give your bit, and then kind of, if you want, like raise your glass and take a drink and stuff like that. Okay. So he's he's doing his talk, and I'm like going through my presentation. It's like it's like the Matrix going on inside my mind. I'm going, oh, I'm going to say this, this, or that. So he then hands me a mic, and I didn't know it was going to be another mic. But then I go into my presentation, and it's going well. Do you know when you when you when you're giving this Talk and mm -hmm. don't you think this is I'm on fire I'm good yep. and and that and, it, and you can to see me, the emotion of the and crowd you can see people responding and stuff and it was good so then I finish and then at the end I'm like messing around with the mic to try and put the mic back down and grab my drink everyone starts clapping and applauding me I'm like oh god I was supposed to do like a drink I don't know where it came from but it was like spur of the moment I've got quite a loud voice. Uh, when well, I got it, so I grabbed the drink and I went, "Ladies and gentlemen," and everyone's like, "Stop!" I went, "God save the Queen and God bless America." <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And Ambassador Johnson then used some decidedly undiplomatic language and went, "That's brilliant." So like, <laughs> <laughs> so, How was that received? Yeah, not good. Was there any? There was blowback. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't hear anything firsthand when I told the commander of my unit. He was seemed to be pleased and things, but from insiders in the headquarters, they were saying that the normal the normal point was who does he think he is? And then a friend of mine who was working there, he apparently said, "Well, what do you think he was going to do? Stop telling me he wasn't going to do it." But but it was it was I'm quite I'm glad it happened. But I yeah. think it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, Man, with them, um, um, and then uh, like I said, there was. So that was a point in my life when I was like, a few months after that, I, I felt like I wasn't going to be in a position to give anything back to the army and my unit. So I was like, I asked if I could write a book about it. They said, yes, there's some other factors. And I, I thought, oh, well, now's, now's the time to get out. 28 years, I've had a good run. Let's, let's go. Yeah. And that's when I got out. Man, I... um. I'm sorry your country is not giving you the credit that you deserve. That is, uh, what a shame. I mean, there's lots of people who support me and I'm re really thankful for that. So, you know, I should, that's why I try, I'm concentrating on, I'm not, I'm not even bitter. You know, I, I said it, I know I'm bitter towards, I'm not really bitter towards the government. It's just more like, I expect nothing less. Yeah. That, so I'm not. I'm not even that upset. It's just like yeah, because I've seen it happen so many times with other things. I'm like, it doesn't surprise me. But the main thing is that so many people do support me, and yeah. that's that's something. It's not as if I did that and everyone hated me. Then it's a diff different thing. Or but the the fact of the matter is like, people in the army, people there's there will be. Sure, there's tons of people in the foreign office and the government who who really like what I did, but there is certainly a, must be a good chunk somewhere that really do not like what I did and what I stand for, 
Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it, it be nice if more people were like you and stood up for what was right in that office? Well, this is the thing. Do you know, like, people need to, like, cowardice is everywhere. And, like, brave, bravery in whatever aspect goes a long way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be something grand like the D2 incident at 14 Riverside Drive. It can just be saying, it could be voicing your opinion when someone's bad mouthing someone else. Yeah. Just stepping, standing up and saying, actually, I think you are out of line. He's a good guy. Instead of just keeping quiet. It's that line of like, no decision is always his decision. So, and and it's the same thing of like people saying, oh, well, I would have done this. Or I would have done, if I'd been there, I would have done that. Or if I, would you? Yeah. I don't think you would. You would, you know, when people say, oh, I would have, if I was in Ovaldi, I would have done this. You weren't there. So maybe you should just hold your mouth. Yes, there's some people who I think are going to stand before God for what the decisions they made that day. But there's other people who are just following orders. And and if someone had called me on in Kenya and said, do not, whatever you do, do not go in there, there's a probable chance I probably wouldn't have went in because I'm in the military. Maybe I would have ignored it. But I, but I, but I probably wouldn't have. But here's the thing. Last year... It might be in the year before, though all the years nowadays seem to roll into one. I stopped a girl from being kidnapped. You stopped a girl from being kidnapped? Yeah. Where? Because no one in Hereford, at half past six in the evening, a girl's trying to get bundled into a car and no one's stopping. No, everyone's walking past. And I'm like, so I'm walking down the road. I can hear this girl shout, help, help, help. And I look at across. Yeah, I'm like about 100 yards um, from her on the other side of the road and I'm looking across. She's outside a pub, like a busy a busy public house. So so straight away in my thought, I'm thinking, well, she's probably drunk and they're probably just trying to get her in the car and it's not like, a, it's just a reluctant, you got to go home. No, I'm all right. So I thought I'd give them the benefit. People are walking past or people driving, help. As they're close, I say there's... Um, um, Two people trying to load her into a car. They're trying to get her into a car, and she's like pushing back off it, and they're trying, like, got her either side. And they're trying to push. She keeps, she's fine. Help, help! As it gets kind of level with her, she then ch- something changes. It was like somebody, please help me. But it was the 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 tone, the frequency uh-huh. that that sort of got me, and I was like, and then it, as I level with me, there was a woman with two kids. And she was like, why is no one helping? And I went, have you seen what's gone on there? Well, you've seen what's going on. She went, no, but no one's helping. No one's doing anything. And she had two young boys and I'm like, or two young children. And I was like, okay, call the police. I goes, do me a favor, call the police. So I walk, start walking across the road, it's quite a large, like wide road. And I start walking towards the car. I then break into like a canter and like moment towards, and the guy gets out, the driver gets out the car aggressively gets out the car and he's like looking he like gets out and I'm like and I'm doing this run towards him like this canter and I put my arms out to the side like this and I don't say anything vocally but I can I am saying something without words and I'm what I'm saying to him is buddy I don't I don't want any trouble but I'm about to fuck you up if you want and he re- he registers that because he's like then he shouts oh she owes me money she owes me money and gets in the car and he like shouts at the two and they're the other two, one of them whacks her on the head, they get in the car and drive speed off. And like to the woman, are you all right? Are you all right? And she went, leave me alone. And she like staggers, or staggers away. At the same time, a police van is coming down, not responding to this call. And I wave them down and there's a female police officer inside and I said, hey, just so you know, someone's just trying to be kidnapped. And then this woman with the kids runs up behind me and says, this man's a hero, this man's a hero. I'm like, no. And, um, and I said, yeah, and I said, and I give them like an update and she t- takes notes. And then that's the last I've heard of it. So, man. But, so I, I don't know what happened, but uh, I don't know whether the police followed up and didn't follow up with me. I don't know if it's ongoing. I don't know whatever. But the moral of this story is I, I, even if you do some, something is 
I didn't do anything. The only thing I did, I didn't even open my mouth. I just walked across the road and confront, confronted someone with nonverbal communication. You made yourself available. And that was enough to potentially save someone's life because who knows what they're going to do to her. They're bundling a, a, a 20-something woman into a car. Nothing good was going to happen there. If they're willing to use physical force to get someone in the car, they're not going to take her away and just have a chat with her and make her pay money. They're going to do shit. You know that. And if you think otherwise, you're living in a different planet. Yeah. But all I did was all I did was something, and some no matter how small it is, something that's en that's enough to make a big change. Yeah. And people, people still there's this decision paralysis. There's lots of people I think now. If you had a group of guys, a group of people, doesn't matter what they do, you tell them to go and run into a burning building and save people. Most people will do that if you tell them to, if you order them to. We're at this state in society now where people are scared, but they're not scared of physical damage or death. They're scared of the consequences of their action. And it's causing this decision paralysis where people don't want to be the one to make the call. Mm -hmm. And whilst they're doing that, people are dying. Mm -hmm. Because every second counts. I'm glad you brought that up. It is um, sad what's happening. They are, I don't even know who they are, yeah. but they are demoralizing society from doing the right thing. Mm. And, and even the, like the little things, if someone could collapse, and now we're, we're, some people would straight away go to work, what's going on? Other people just be like, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get involved in case I get taken to court, because if he dies, I'm, like, cause I'm giving CPR and he dies, I'm like, why are you even thinking that? Yeah. Should just be bummed. What can I do? When I when I when I when I did what I did that day, I didn't think, right, oh I could get oh what if this happens? I was just like, gotta do the right thing. Boom. I'm in. No well maybe I haven't got permission. I maybe I'll wait outside to get permission, maybe I'll do that. I didn't, I just went for it. I'd like to think other people would do that. Sadly, I think lots of people, the majority, wouldn't do that. Well, there's no videos of anybody else entering that building. People, people did make themselves available. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's not very many people that would do it. But, and that's sad. And that's the message. Here I am. Send me. Let's go. Let's go for it. You, you're it. Sometimes I've said this before. You know, when the whole, everything's collapsing around you and you could be, you might not be a super duper tier one special forces operator, but you're it. No one else is going to protect your family. No one else is going to do what needs to be done. And you've got to, you've got to think, I guess I've got to do it. And then who dares wins? Maybe you're going to fail and die and suffer the consequences but maybe you're gonna win and save a lot of lives. That's what people need to think and be aware of. Those of you that have been around SRS for a while know that we take mental health very seriously here. So seriously that in almost every episode, you'll find a segment where we discuss how to improve your mental health. And part of improving your mental health is keeping your mind sharp. And part of keeping your mind sharp is giving it the fuel that it needs to balance energy, focus, cognition, and just regenerating your brain. That triggered me to go on a journey to find the supplement that supports brain health with the cleanest of ingredients on the planet. And I found it. I was actually gonna start my own company and do this, but I found Laird Superfoods. I've partnered with them. Now I'm a partial owner, and I really believe in these products. Here's my favorite product, Performance Mushrooms by Laird Superfoods. Brain fuel. You can put this in your coffee, you can put it in your tea, you can drink it raw, you can mix it with their greens, you can do all kinds of stuff. Bottom line is, this is the best possible supplement with the cleanest ingredients, all sourced in the United States that supports brain health. And here's two other products that I'm a fan of. Laird Superfoods Creamer, guess what? 
contains functional mushroom extracts. Put this in your tea or coffee. And most of you know I'm not a caffeine or coffee drinker, but a lot of you are, and they just happen to have Laird Superfoods coffee, organic Peruvian coffee with, you guessed it, functional mushrooms that support and regenerate your brain. Go to LairdSuperfoods.com. Use the promo code SRS. You'll get 20% off. Guys, this is the real deal. These are the finest of ingredients. Check it out. LairdSuperfoods.com. Promo code SRS. 20% off. All right, Christian, we're back from the break. We can uh, ease the tension a little bit. We don't have to dance around anything anymore. But um, I want to get into some of the stuff that you're doing now. So I know you wrote one book, which may or may not ever be released, but I love the children's book that you wrote, The Wrong Wolf. The messaging in there is fantastic. It's a great story for kids. And and, um, where did the inspiration for that come from? Well... Um, the story of the wrong wolf never, never lived in my mind. Didn't, never thought about this, the story as it is. It, it didn't occupy any space. I never thought about writing a children's book, full stop. Not once. Um, the, the only thing similar to it, I was talking to a friend of mine from a similar unit in the US military, and we were talking about the wolves and sheepdogs, how the... And one of the th- points that we came up with was that sheepdogs don't kill wolves, they scare wolves away. The only thing that can kill a wolf is a wolf. And that that's kind of what, like, you could say is, like, what, what, what I am, maybe set up to be a criminal or from a, from a bad area. And, like, life was setting up to be that, but I actually became a, became a, became a, a sheepdog wolf, like a wolf t- uh, turned sheepdog. And I think special operations are full of those sorts of people. It's not the majority of people in in in, in there. So that was that was that was the only like connection in my mind. And uh, uh, and the th- so I'm listening to your podcast in the gym, Jim Cav- when you're talking to Jim Caviezel. That one's gone now. And uh, I'm I'm listening to that in the in the gym, and uh, and I'm working out and. I think you say, oh, we need more sheepdogs. Jim Caviezel chips in and says, we need more converted wolves, that's what we need. And like a data transmission, that story, the story of the one wolf, just came into my mind. Bang. Like the story. And it wasn't... I never, ever thought about writing a children's book. Ever. Bang, the story just comes in my mind. Not just the story, but the pictures... The whole idea, the whole thing. And it's not just, oh, I'll do that. It was like, stop me in my tracks kind of thing. It was like, and I just stopped working out, got in the car, got back um, to where I was living and started writing down notes, like a rough idea. Picked up the phone to uh, Matt Klein. Uh, is a good friend of mine, ex-US Army, ex-NYPD, great artist. Uh, phoned him up. He, uh, he'd already published a children's book with his wife. And this is a thing. I, I, I didn't even think about it. It was just like, oh, I need to do a children's book. So it came to me like weird. It was so weird. And I was like, dude, I've had this idea for a children's story. I, I'm, could, you, could you do some pictures? And I goes, I want to do it. I goes, I feel like I need to do it right now. And he's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm about to go and hold it, but I can try and get it all in. How many, how many pictures? And I work, I'd worked it out, and I said, it's going to be about 30 pictures, but I'll let you know tomorrow. By the next day, all the pictures in that book, I knew what they were. 
and you've never changed since. So like less than 24 hours of having this idea, picture number one. Um, pack of wolves in the mountains howling at the howling at the wolves. That's what I sent to him. Picture two, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They've they, so all of it was just so part of me feels like I didn't even write it. It was like just given to me. Wow. To get it out there. So, um and it's a it's a great story. Um and I hope when people people um, I thank you to everyone who's pre ordered it or who, who did pre order it. And I I I just kind of hope and I, I think that people are going to buy it out of support of me and then go, then speak to, to people who don't know who I am and say, hey, by the way, you might want to buy your kids this book because it's a great message. And uh, it's, a good, it's a good story that lots of people, I think, can identify with. Mm-hmm. So it's um, a metaphorical story. People who know the story of Kenya could say there's elements of the book are from Kenya, maybe. Are there elements of the book that are from my army career? Definitely. Is the elements of the book from my childhood? Yes. But it's not exclusive to me because I think most people will look in that book and they will be, they'll be able to put themselves in pages of this book as well. What, 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 how do you summarize that story? The, I'll tell you how I summarize it. I thought it was fantastic. It is, a, it is about a wolf that doesn't belong who tries to fit into a new tribe and has to prove himself he proves himself by standing up and doing the right thing yeah so there's so many lessons in such a short story in there mm -hmm. i mean it's 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 it goes over the feeling of not belonging it goes over the feeling of of Fitting in with a new tribe, yeah, which we discussed mm. a lot of that at the very beginning of this episode, right? Pleasing people, trying to fit in with a new tribe. It's your, it's your story. Yeah, it's your story. Standing up for the right thing. It's about again about loss cover a uh, lot, and I mean the the easy way to put it, just really simplify it. It's about a wolf that becomes a sheepdog. But like you said, it's about someone who's different. Who knows he's different? Someone who loses his um, his only friend or mentor. Again, standing up for people doing the right thing gets excluded from one tribe, to then go to another tribe where he still doesn't fit in, and they don't value him. But then, when bad things happen, he steps up and saves them all, and only then is he accepted. And uh, it's like there's like and like I said that's that's not exclusive to me that's everyone there's lots of people whether you work in a you're the person who might work in an office and people you work really hard and people don't like them and yet they'll go home that weekend and bake cakes for everyone I mean that's a really it doesn't have to be anything grand like running into a hotel or it it, it could be something as simple as that where you're you're doing good things for ungrateful people. And only, and eventually they'll maybe um, to see what is what's for. But it's um, the other message that is a bit more subtle is is like I try to say, nothing ever dies, nothing really dies, not a person, not an idea, not a story. It just goes somewhere else and changes. Maybe. What else is coming down the line for you? Well, we'll see how the the near future goes but um i'm looking to start a youtube channel putting out some different content out there um which i think a lot of people will be happy with I th certainly a lot of people always ask me if i'm going to start a youtube channel do you have a youtube channel yet and you just don't put content on it no. i would love to yeah. direct people to a youtube channel yeah i haven't done one yet but i'll let you know maybe i'll let you maybe i'll have one set up before this if you Create one, yeah. even if there's not anything in there, let me know. And when we release this, I'll put it in the intro. And I'm sure people will jump over there and follow you no matter what. Um, so there's that. And then I'm doing some good uh, future work with Staccato, uh, Sons of Liberty, and Field Ethos. Cool. What's Field Ethos? Is the, the hunt, a hunting journal. 
Uh, the, yeah. What will you be doing with them? Um, uh, I'm, it's been on the it's been on the forecast for a long time. We're looking to do some content with them, related content to do with hunting or similar activities. And and um, there'll be I'm going to drop a we're going to start an e-commerce shop. Uh, the name to to be conf- to be confirmed of, of the website shop, but we're going to be releasing um, official Chris Craighead merch and bits oh, and pieces. Oh, that's awesome! And, and collaborations will feature on there and things like that. What are some? So this is going to be hard for you, mm-hmm. but what are some things that you need to be successful? You have a audience of over two million people. Yeah, I just think, what do I need to be successful? What are you looking for? Throw it out in the world. You never know what's going to come back at yeah. you. Um, I'm, I'm open to a lot of things, and I think a lot of people don't approach me because they either think I've got everything tied up or that I'm already signed up. I'm kind of a free spirit, so I'm, 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 I'm looking for people to, you know, pe- people from whether it be whatever industry say, hey, I want to work with you, then reach out to me. Good um, to me through through Instagram. Do you hear that, everybody? He's a free agent. So he's looking for people to make connections. He's looking for people to help him build a business. And there's a lot of people that watch this show that can help you do that. And I hope they come your way. So, but man, I guess Christian, I just got to say, man, it was a real honor to sit across from you today and, and, and get some of your story. And man, you're just, uh, you're just a great example to, to our youth. Thank and, you. um, which is becoming a rarity all across the world. And, um, I just want to say thank you for that, man. You carry yourself very well. You carry a lot of respect. You're a great example. And, um, man, I'm just happy you're here. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. I really am. And, um, before we go, I need three recommendations of who you would like to see on this show. <sighs> Donald Trump. <laughs> I think it would be, uh, very interesting to get president Trump on here. I think he, he, uh, he, I think he, uh, I don't know what you would talk about, but goals, I think it'd be, it'd be interesting for him to come on here and yeah, yeah you come up with an unusual, like, um, questions that maybe he doesn't get asked in other, uh, other, other places. I would love to get As, that interview. And I think it is especially relevant if you ask him is his role as commander in chief. And I think that's, that would be interesting. Um. Um, because he's ultimately he's the top of the chain then. Um, so, um, he, he, he would, he would be a good person to, to have on something like that's different. Yeah. Um, I'll try to make that happen. You got anybody else? Two more. I th- yeah. I, I mean, if you, I wish you'd asked me this a bit earlier and I would have had these prep dances. And <laughs> that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Putting you on the spot. Um, yeah I mean I don't know I always like it, it's all horses for courses as they say I, 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 I like the more off the track sort of stuff mm-hmm. where some people like the veterans and the, the special ops and I, I like, like that's why I, one of the reasons for seeing Donald Trump is that I get different perspective yeah. from the, the he's the commander in chief or was the commander in chief and uh, so, like, so, like that we could tie in special operations and decision making and signing things off for him. I think it'd be interesting. So, so to think of other people. Um, I mean, I'd love to get Joe Biden, but I don't think he's going to be able to walk up those stairs. You know, I, I can't. <laughs> Actually, I know he won't be able to walk up those stairs. Yeah. But are you going to edit that out? Because they'll definitely come for you. Well, um, I'm sure they're already coming for me. <laughs> um, you could get, I, I know a good person, actually, and I'm ashamed it took me so long, Melee Chapin. Who's that? Melee, the girl from the Doucet. 
the the woman yeah. that was in the hotel yeah. that wrote the book mm -hmm. that you saved. Yeah. Roger that. Oh. Roger that. We'll reach out. Yeah. Well, brother, I'll, uh, I'll let you off on the third one, unless you want to keep going. Um, I'm now booking myself, and I'll be driving home going, ah, oh, I should have said, oh, why didn't I say that? Oh, what about him? What about her? What about this? I like, oh. Well, um, yeah. I Roger think, that. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you for coming, and more importantly, thank you for saving those Americans' lives. And everybody's lives, all 700 of them that day. That is a, I seriously doubt I will ever sit in front of another human being that can say that they saved 700 lives in one day. So that means the world to me, man. And uh, God bless you. Cheers. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.